就是可能大家通过这个 video 应该很初步的对我们这项目已经有一个一个一个一个基础的一个概念了，因为。其实我们一直在关注的一个事情，其实整个促使我们团队开始启动这个项目最核心的一个一个研究的话题叫影响力经济。呃，我觉得这其实影响力经济并不是一个非常新的一个话题。呃，我我觉就自从我就最早我们在接触各种各样的一些，我我其实我最早是做广告，在广告公司工作过，然后后来去做了很多社交类的一些互联网的项目。我觉得其实很多商业模式都是建立在影响力经济的这样的一个基础上。然后我也预约读了蛮多，其实呃，国内外的一些学者，呃，在这影响力经济的模型上所做的各种各样的研究，呃，当中一直在讨论到一个话题，就是如何界定，就是说把把影响力这样的一个比较呃抽象的概念，呃，能量化，并且转化成商业价值，就这样一个这样一个模型，其实所有很多很多学者都在研究，也在通过各种商业模式创造一些新的一些项目去验证。然后呃，然后到今天，呃，我觉得其实区块链以及区块链所对应的前面早上一直提到一个很重要的一个观点叫 tokenize， 呃，这样一个方法，它其实在这样一个解决影响力经济这样的一个问题，其实是非常非常好的一个方方向。所以呃，其实 i n f l u e n c e Chain 我们所核心在关注的问题就是如何通过 tokenize 加上区块链的目前。最流行的一些玩法，能够实现真正意义上的影响力价值的一个商业化，或者是呃，通过这个价值的一个转化。呃，然后。我们把自己定义成，把我们整个这样的一个平台定义成粉丝经济的一个四点零的一个应用。呃，为什么这么说？就是呃，我我我就就是粉丝经济其实是一个，就就很多商业形态一直在用的这样的一个一个一个一个一个概念。然后，嗯、呃，早期的一个粉丝经济，其实我我们直接从二点零时代开始说起，就是最早的一些从 Web 二点零时代，其实大部分的一个互联网创业的项目都是。围绕着粉丝经济这样一个概念来做的，就不管是新浪的，就在国内来说比较知名的一些微博或者是博客，呃，我们发现从粉丝从最早的可以和明星在通过互联网的方式产生一些互动，那最早的互动形式局限在关注或者是评论、点赞，然后到最近的几年，我发现可能明星也好，主播也好，可以开始从他的粉丝或 follower 这当中，呃。赚到一定的一些商业利益，就比如说，所以它出来一些新的模式，主要比如说一一一一一种方向是打赏，呃，现在的很多呃内容型的平台上，呃，阅读者或粉丝可以开始为他的喜欢的主播或喜欢的明星去打赏。那到前几年开始一下子火起来的直播平台，然后我们看到就是说用户巨大大量的一个粉丝可以通过。刷礼物的方式去支持他所喜欢的明星或喜欢的主播，然后，但我发现其实到现在为止，大部分的粉丝和他所喜欢的明星也好、名人也好，他的互动形式是在我们看来是单向的。为什么单向？就是说他，就是对粉丝，他其实单向单方面的可以通过一些付出一些成本来换取一个一种满足感，但他们本身其实在这个当中很难得到一个。呃，自己自己除了能够得到一个可能比较可能一个心理上的满足感之外，其实他很难去获得一些实质上的回报。那这是我们当我们所看到的一个一个机会，因为我觉得呃，就是通过区块链加 tokenize 的这样的一个方式，是有可能形成一个双向的。一个商业模式，就是转变原来的粉丝和他所对应的明星的一个互动方式，就是说，他不是单向的，只是打赏或支持，而是有可能共同去收获一些价值。那那呃，当然就围绕这样的一个话题，我们开始，我们就开展了整个影链的整个项目的一个基础建设。呃那所以其实，名人的名人或者是 IP 的一个帮他的数字资产去 tokenize， 是我们整个平台的一个核心。那所以其实本质上来说，影链所打造的是一个垂，就它本质上它底层是一个垂直领域的一个交易所。
呃，前面其实早上已经提到很多，其实 token 的交易平台。那我们自己的观点是会觉得，其实呃呃 ，token n i g h t 会成为未来很多。商业环境中的一种主流的一个运作模式，那交易所也会像现在的呃，仅仅是一些比较呃，相当于主流的交易所，会走向说会存在垂直行业的垂直领域的一些交易所，那不同的 token 可能会在不同的一些交易平台上所交易，那呃，影链就是 infra 线，我们所。在这个平台当中，最核心的一个环节就是我们打造的在泛娱乐行业内的一个交易平台。那在这个交易平台上，它所交易的 token， 呃，可能不一定会是那种我们现在看到的，呃，呃，供电项目为主的技术类的一些项目，而是说，呃，在泛娱乐行业内，呃，它可能是一些名人、明星自己所发布的 token， 也有可能是，呃，一些 IP。它的版权、知识产权，他们通过一些新的运作方式所生产出来的 token 所交易的一个一个一个方式。嗯所以，我们其实所做的一件事情，就是最核心的一个技术概念，也像前前面提到的，就是我们基于区块链，我们希望能够把影响力转化成。实际的价值，那上面其实所需要的一个中间件，就是前面提到的数字资产，或者是叫我们叫数字化的版权。然后还还蛮有趣的是，我们在最近的这段过程当中，我去了解了蛮多，呃，我们和很多就这种泛娱乐行业的一些大型的机构去。我和他们去沟通、去交流，然后包括像呃一些娱乐公司，然后呃还蛮有趣的一点是，我真的发现他们当中有很多的机构，他们是有签约一些明星或者是一些呃 IP 类形象的数字化的版权，然后呃在以往。其实这个数字化版权，即使签约下来，我们会发现它它的变现或把它商业化，始终存在一定的一个一个一个限制或者是一个一个门槛。那这也是我们所找到的一个机会。呃，其实呃呃，如果能够。搭建一个平台，帮助这些这些现已经在行业当中比较成熟的企业，他们手上已经有的那些数字化数字化的版权或数字化的资产，通过 token 的方式带来一些新的商业价值的转化，那这有可能会是形成一片新的一个一个一个一个一个领域。那其实整个。因数字线索，我们所我们在打造的价值生态当中，可能有四个最核心的环节。那第一个就是 Index， 等下我会对这四个环节做一个简单的一个介绍，因为 Index 是我们的最核心的前面提到的一个交易所。那我也我们也发行了我们自己的一个 Token。然后，呃 i n f l u e n c e Lab 是我们的孵化器，以及说，呃，我们也做了一个基于我们整个商业形态下，就我们所打造的这个生态环境下的一个呃投资基金。那先从 Index 说起，呃呃 ，Index 前面提到了，它是一个垂直领域的一个交易所，它未来所面对的主要的客户，或者是我们所希望在这个平台、这个交易平台上所发布的 token， 就是主要是在泛娱乐生态下。它有粉丝、有影响力的一些呃的一些 token， 那呃除了我觉得本质上它除了是一个呃现在我们所做的这个 index， 它本质上它可能还是一个呃币币交易所，呃有大家熟悉的这样的一个一个一个交易平台，但我们可能更会关注的。除了平台性能本身之外，我们会花更多的精力在用户体验的提升上面，因为我们现在所想要做的事情是能够让更多的普通的用户，就他可能是传统的互联网的用户或者是明星的粉丝，他其实完全对于现在这样的一个交易平台是陌生的这群用户，能够通过我们在用户体验上的一些提升，转化成这样的一个我们这样一个交易平台的用户，这是我们在产品层面所要考虑的最重比较重要的一些环节。那第二。层面是，呃，我们觉得这个生态当中，就自己我们在看整个交易所未来的一个一些新的可能性，就我们对于在我们这个平台上所发布的 token 的一些应用场景。呃，会做比较多的一个关注，所以我们会在这个交易平台上，呃，比较重要的去推出我们的一个，呃，其实是前面早上我们其实也提提到过的一个概念，就大家提到听到过的一个概念，就是呃一些 application 的一个商城。那因为呃我自己在看，我觉得嗯、呃，明星也好，艺人也好，或者是一些 IP， 他们 tokenize 的玩法可能和。呃，现在一些供电项目的一个运作方法会不太一样，他们会更倾向于偏向于应用端。
这偏向于这些 token 在他们的商业生态当中如何通过一些应用场景去转化。那这一块也是在我们平台上会比较相对比较重视的，因为呃，我目前发现其实大部分的用户，呃，他和 token 之间的关系更多的只是在交易。因为这些 token 本身本质上它是很难去直接落地或对接到一些应用场景当中去，但反而说，呃，在我们这个平台上，我们所部署的这个生态当中，更多的 token 其实是呃有机会去落地到一些商业化的应用场景当中去，所以这也是说我们在我们的产品当中会更多的去部署，呃，在。就在比如说，包括我们会呃设计比较完善的 token 的 API， 能够让更多的开发者参与到基于这个 token 的一个应用是应用应用应用类的开发当中去。那这是比较核心的一个部分。啊，当然这是呃现在我们在规划的整个 Index 的一些 UI 的一些界面，呃，这我们就很快就看过。嗯，那呃第二个核心的部件就是我们自己所发布的这个 token。那呃，其实 I C token 比较简单，我们简单去理解，它其实是在我们整个 influence chain 的这样的一个商业生态所要打造的这样生态当中的一个流通入场券。那它可能会在几个不同的场景去应用，一块就是在我们前面所提到的这个垂直行业的一个交易所，因为它比如说它可以多，呃 I C 是作为我们这样的我们自己所生产的这个 token， 它起到了一个对价的功能，那可以用 I C 去。直接去支付其他，或者是去交换交易其他的一些 token。那同时，呃，在我们到交易所当中，不管是一些投票的功能，或者是一些呃呃一些增值的服务，可能都会是用到呃我们自己的这个 token 去呃作为一个交换的筹码。那第二块就是说，在一些行业的应用上面，我们可能会蛮关注的是，说我们希望能够通过这个 token 来实现民民就,就我们上面的一些泛娱乐行业的一些明星生态当中的一些商业使用的可能性。比如说去呃参与到一些相关的一些活动，作为一个支付的工具，或者是说呃呃我们本身所所打造的一个一个类似像 e-commerce 的一些平台，可以通过去支付一些一些东西。呃，那这是我们整个 i n f o s l a 环节的第二个部件。那 i n f o s l a 是我们比较也是现在相对来说是我们比较核心在做的一件事情，就是因为前面提到。基于 IP 或明星的这个 tokenize， 它其实是确实是一个蛮新的一个话题。那整个行业其实都是在摸索的过程当中。那那我们现在自己呃组了一个团队，这个团队最核心的作用就是说，我们也在希望说在，在呃因为因为确实现在很多呃名人也好，明星也好，或者是 IP 也好，它。在整个区块链的这样一这个生态当中，它们是缺乏一些经验和知识的。那我们希望能够通，就通过我们的经验去结合他们实际的需求，去帮助他们去打造和发布他们自己的一些 token。那呃，当然这是在前期，我觉得这个过程是非常重要。我们自己组了一个团队，然后我们去研究他们的一个现有的商业模式，也去摸索有没有可能通过 token 的方式去转变他们现在商业生态当中。就原有的一个一个运作逻辑，去结合现在新的区块链的一个操作方式，最终去生产他们自己的一些 token。那当然，在未来，我们当然倾向于说，呃，越来越多的行业机构也好，他们能够基于我们的一个提供的技术平台，他们能够完全自发的去自主的去生产自己的一个项目。那我们更多的会提供在整个产业当中，或者是在技术当中的一个服务。呃。那最后一个环节就是我我们所说的一个一个前面我们把它称之为叫 influence capital。那为什么会有这样一个东西？就是呃呃，就我觉得这是我自己会认为这也是我们整个生态当中非常重要的一个部分。因为很多人会问到，就是如何能够让你们所设计的这个生态保持活跃和繁荣。那最核心的是，我们需要让更多的行业参与者能够进入到我们生态当中去。那呃，比较简单的方式就是我们在前面所发布的，就我们自己所发行的 token 当中预留一定一定的比例作为一个投资的成本。那投资的目标主要是就是在我们这个行业当中的一些优质的企业。那这些企业如果接受我们的投资，需要。呃，我们更我们我我们给他们提供的更多的价值是希望他们的服务和产品与我们所打造的这样的一个生态去结合，成为我们整个生态当中的一个部分。那同时也会增加，增加本身就不增加本就我们自己的这个 token 的一个流动性。呃，那上面写的四个领域其实也是我们可能会关注的四个领域，其中包括像泛娱乐行业的这样的垂直的一个领域，包括从技术开发的领域。
呃，以及一些呃，从行业相关的一些机构，呃，以及一些线下的应用场景。那在这些场景当中，我们更希望去呃呃，通过呃，一方面通过投资，一方面通过我们服务的方式，让更多的呃行业的参与者能够在我们这样一个平台当中去呃呃，是就是说去去产生一些新的机会。呃。基本上，这就是整个 i n f o s c h a n 所在做的一个事情，以及说未来我们所打造的一个一个一个做未来所要做的一些计划。然后，呃，其实整个项目从创立到现在，差不多有接近接近快一年的时间了，不到一年啊。去年六月份创立到现在，我们整个过程上确实一边在摸索整个整个整个各种各样的一些可能性、可行性，也也同时在做着我们自己的各种各样的一些技术导的一些工作。然后最后我也想放一个视频，让大家感受一下，就在之前的一段时间当中，我们大家做了一些什么样的事情。放第二个视频。We kicked off the world tour of Day Foods Chain since last September. So, Bangkok, Dubai, and Singapore. We welcome everyone here, as well as the people from all over the world, to join the Day Foods Revolution. Fast economy is a new way of interaction between agencies and supporters. We will work on the school with creating foods to be on board. Top stars, movie stars, bloggers, sports items. 我觉得市场是一个很传统的区块链这样的。我今天听到这些东西是一个革命性的工具。We can convert the intangible influence into tangible assets. To aid you many your talents, earning projects, and moving projects. How do you feel, Mr. Chen? 呃，然后最后也也也也正好也是一个非常巧的一个机缘，就是呃，安 C 是将在北京时间，呃，三月三十一号下午三点，那应该也就是今天晚上美国时间的十一点，呃，正式登陆交易所，然后也在这边。好，非常感谢 ，Thank you so much. Now we have our keynote speaker for the afternoon session, Mr. Eric Lee. Eric is the CEO and founder of Hub, a project working to create a new trust protocol on blockchain. Eric was a co-founder of LinkedIn and served as its founding founding CTO. And Eric himself is a four-time serial entrepreneur. Today, Eric would like to share his insights in how crypto will become mainstream by 2025. Welcome, Eric. Good afternoon, Niha. So today I'm going to talk about a topic that should be very important to us all uh, in terms of uh, bringing crypto to the mainstream. And uh, you know, we all want to see this technology succeed. And uh, I'd like to share some ideas about how uh, we might be able to do that. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I was one of the co-founders of. LinkedIn back in 2002. I was the founding CTO of the company, so uh, my background is definitely in the technology area, and uh, it uh, was a very fascinating journey. Uh, LinkedIn has become one of the uh, most successful uh, social platforms on the planet. Uh, it currently has more than 500 million users. Uh, it has a uh, real business model around recruiting. Uh, not necessarily based on advertising. Um, and uh, a couple years ago, it was sold to Microsoft uh, for some billions of dollars. Uh, and so it was quite a successful platform. Uh, however, uh, when you look underneath the covers, uh, you start to see uh, maybe some uh, weaknesses or some opportunities for improving uh, on uh, LinkedIn and also other social platforms. And so some of those examples uh, happen to be uh, the information that LinkedIn has about its users, uh, the profiles uh, 
are sometimes maybe uh, misleading. Uh, LinkedIn has gotten very successful in terms of getting people to enter information into uh, the network about themselves. Uh, but that also introduces the opportunity for falsifying that information. And so on LinkedIn, you never know uh, whether there's a, a fake profile or uh, part of a profile that is fake uh, as well. One of the other problems that we discovered also at LinkedIn was that uh, people tend to uh, contact each other quite a bit, right? Contact uh, and uh, offer their services, uh, advertise uh, for them, and uh, that results in kind of a spammy uh, type of uh, communication. Uh, so this, in regards to its success, it's become very successful, but at the same time, it's revealed uh, some opportunities for improvement. And I think today, with uh, a lot of the talk around you know, Facebook and uh, data breaches and fake news, uh, all of that is uh, all the more relevant. So I want to talk a little bit about my uh, journey into uh, crypto and uh, how I you know, got to uh, here to talk to you about uh, blockchain and crypto today. Um, so as we were beginning the journey about a year ago uh, to really understand and talk about uh, blockchain and hopefully do something productive in blockchain, uh, there, was, there was definitely a lot of news about uh, what had happened on Facebook and the fake news and the uh, very important decisions that are being made, in this case political decisions around that information. And uh, really, if you look a little bit deeper, uh, those uh, issues have to do with uh, a lack of uh, trust, right? A lack of trust in the uh, information or maybe even misplaced trust. Uh, how do you understand the trustworthiness of information and the trustworthiness of uh, the people who are giving you uh, that information on which uh, very important decisions uh, are made? And so when I began uh, understanding or trying to understand blockchain, there were a lot of new concepts, right? Blockchain, uh, tokens, uh, decentralization, consensus, proof of work, proof of stake, uh, security versus uh, utility tokens. There's a lot of really uh, very new concepts uh, to uh, understand. And um, as I started reading more and as I started to uh, read everything that I could, uh, talk to people, and, and, and learn from the community, uh, all of these concepts really began to uh, fit together, like some very amazing uh, puzzle pieces. And um, it, it really dawned on me that uh, there were some very amazing and very clever concepts uh, in, in crypto. So I can't uh, go on too much without um, you know, showing you this. This is a Bitcoin that's on uh, fire. And um, usually there's a couple ways to interpret a, uh, something on fire. Uh, usually it's doing well. Uh, and in this case, it's not, not doing so well uh, today. So uh, there's been uh, some you know, very interesting fluctuations in the market around uh, Bitcoin and uh, other cryptocurrencies as well. Um, and I, I think the reason why you're finding this today is because uh, I think people are trying to understand the underlying value of these tokens, right? And so for Bitcoin in particular, you know, it's something that has been in the press for a long time, and people understand it as uh, digital gold. It, it's sort of a reserve uh, currency, and uh, the value that Bitcoin has is the value that people believe uh, that Bitcoin, you know, has. Uh, and then there's also a lot of other currencies that are, you know, uh, being born. Things like uh, Ethereum, uh, many others. And uh, we're in very much in the early days of tokens, where uh, a lot of the underlying value behind those tokens are still uh, being established. And so one of the things that I'm very excited about uh, is really the value that is getting established around these tokens uh, in the coming years. And hopefully as that happens, uh, more and more stability will come uh, to all of these uh, cryptocurrencies uh, that we know of. So I want to take a minute just to talk about uh, maybe you know for for people uh, because there's been a lot of news about uh, Bitcoin, uh, but maybe there isn't uh, much understanding yet about this kind of underlying technology uh, called blockchain. And uh, so I want to spend some time to just uh, you know talk about uh, blockchain a little bit and why I believe it's even more interesting and even more valuable. 
uh, than uh, some of the cryptocurrencies uh, that uh, are going on. So, uh, first of all, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain are two different things, right? Bitcoin is a currency and blockchain is a technology uh, that uh, enables it. And uh, so, I think that a lot of people uh, try to under struggle uh, to, to understand blockchain, and I know that I did. And so uh, I'm going to try to explain it in as simple of a way as I as I can. So uh, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, you know ledgers. We've heard a lot about cryptography. Uh, what are those things? And um, so the simplest way that I'm going to try to explain it is with this um, graphic. Uh, so there is a reason why it's called. Um, blockchain and uh, the, you know the reason why blockchain uh, works the way that it does is uh, this uh, idea that when you put something onto a blockchain uh, which is a database when you store something on a database uh, it's uh, hard to tamper with you can't change the information once you've uh, recorded it and so in the blockchain world they have this uh, there is this concept called immutability which is the idea of uh, not being able to change uh, something. And uh, it's, for me, this is the fundamental reason why blockchain uh, is uh, so valuable and so uh, disruptive and so innovative. And um, what does that let you do? There's a very bright guy uh, who uh, many years ago spoke at uh, the World Economic Forum and his name was uh, Don Tapscott. And uh, he talked about the difference between the Internet of Information and the Internet of Value. Uh, and uh, information, as we all know it, Internet is really great at disseminating information, sharing information, allowing people to share information. Um, but uh, value is actually more valuable uh, than information because it is something uh, by definition that people uh, value and this idea of immutability is uh, the thing that allows people to store things of value uh, on the blockchain and so what is a, what is a value? Uh, there's a lot of things that are of value so first of all uh, currency has value and so that's why you see uh, Bitcoin as being the very first application, if you will, of blockchain that allows you to store value uh, on a blockchain. But there are many other things that are also very uh, valuable that you can store on the blockchain. Uh, for example, energy has value, so being able to coordinate an energy market using the blockchain is uh, very interesting. Real estate has uh, value as well. So a lot of assets have value, and so now you can start to actually take the internet and start recording things and tracking things uh, that uh, have value. And so blockchain is really perfect for storing value and also for transferring value. And, and uh, immediately you, you go from an internet that you know, has information, maybe faulty information, uh, to be able to, to really store uh, things that people really care about and uh, you know, have uh, value to, uh, to them. So I be believe that uh, you know, blockchain is one of the most interesting uh, technologies to come uh, in a generation. Uh, so, uh, if you look at you know computing in the last uh, 50 or 60 years, uh, the internet uh, got started uh, pretty early back in the uh, last century. Uh, I don't know if anybody was around when uh, computers were a group full of people operated by uh, special people called computers and they uh, worked on these mainframes. And uh, uh, in uh, this day and age, with the iPhone, you have something that is uh, more than 10 million times more powerful than uh, those boxes that now sit in a museum. So progress on technology and the internet has really uh, advanced quite a lot in the last uh, 50 to 60 years. So you know, one might ask what, what's going to happen with uh, blockchain and the year you know 2025. So I do believe that blockchain, uh, because of its ability to store value, uh, becomes one of the most transformational technologies in a, in a generation. 
and uh, I was around during the dot-com times. Uh, I, I saw the sense of uh, possibilities during that time, and this we're on the cusp of another really amazing uh, generational technology disruption. So the uh, gold sparkles. Uh, in 2025, it is meant to represent the magical things that are going to happen uh, with blockchain uh, in the next few years. So uh, I want to talk about uh, how we're going to take uh, crypto and make it mainstream. That's what I promised to do. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the project hub that we're working on now. So this is a picture of uh, some basket weavers in uh, Kenya, and um, I'm sure they make really fine baskets. Uh, and uh, here's a picture of one of the baskets that, that they've made. Um, and um, certainly, uh, uh, I wonder how many baskets they, they, they do sell, because they can probably make a lot of baskets and, and uh, probably you know, don't uh, have um, the ability to sell more baskets because of their lack of access. Uh, to uh, the market and the rest of the world. So what's interesting to me for blockchain is that um, today there, there are about uh, uh, 7 billion people in the world and only half of them are uh, connected to the internet. So there's about 3.5 billion people still that are unconnected uh, to the internet. And um, uh, a lot of uh, actually political conflicts, in my opinion, arise from the lack of uh, economic opportunities. So if we can give people more access to economic opportunities, uh, we potentially have a more uh, prosperous and uh, hopefully peaceful uh, world. So uh, in the blockchain world, there's a lot of talk about bringing the unbanked uh, into the fold and making them uh, uh, available for uh, services around uh, the, the services that banks would naturally get. Uh, but but I'm, I'm very interested in the unconnected, uh, which represents about half the world's population uh, compared to the unbanked, which represents about a third of the world's population. So the reason why I show this picture is because uh, if we can connect these uh, Kenyan basket weavers uh, into the internet, uh, we for sure are going to uh, reach the mainstream. And I believe that blockchain is uh, you know, going to be the way to do that. So imagine if uh, those who made really good baskets right, uh, became known for making really good baskets uh, around the world, uh, not just in a local village. Wouldn't you like to have one of these baskets um, as well? So being able to connect the other half of the world uh, and bring them on board uh, with uh, economic opportunities um, is a really useful thing to do. And I, I believe that that's what uh, blockchain has the potential to uh, let us do. And of course, this doesn't apply just to baskets, it applies to uh, anything, whether people are selling products or whether they're selling services. Uh, those are really valuable things the more that they have access to uh, the market that, that exists. Um, so that's, that's really the, the opportunity that we have to make available uh, connections between people uh, who are uh, not connected as well as people who are already connected but would like to have more uh, economic opportunity. So how are we going to reach the mainstream? Uh, we need to look at uh, use cases that bring value to the people of the world. So there are a couple of uh, key words there. Uh, value, uh, which means uh, really taking this technology and identifying real world problems that uh, people care about and will bring value to their daily lives. And then use cases, which means that there are many, many different situations where uh, blockchain technology can really be applied uh, to create value for uh, those people. And so if we do those two things, if we take this technology and we do those two things, uh, we'll definitely uh, make a big dent in terms of taking block, uh, crypto and, and bringing it to uh, the mainstream. So in our case, um, with uh, the project that we have, uh, we're really concerned about uh, reputation. So, you know, why, why, why would you say that reputation 
uh, is relevant to uh, the blockchain? Well, it turns out that uh, reputation is actually valuable. That the more reputation that you have, uh, the more uh, value that you have, the more access to economic opportunity uh, that you have. So imagine the, the world's peer-to-peer uh, -peer marketplaces, the world's uh, sharing economy, the world's uh, industries, all being able to accommodate people who have uh, reputation, who can get access to greater uh, economic opportunity. And further imagine, if you will, the ability for them to uh, take their reputation data uh, and to uh, put that on a blockchain so that they can benefit from the uh, activities and economic uh, opportunities uh, that exist uh, from that. So if you think about that and you think about how big these, um, these segments are in terms of uh, the peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces and the you know, sharing economies and how that's going to be growing uh, so much uh, in the next you know few years, and how those are really trillions of dollars of uh, you know industries, uh, and and if you can imagine uh, that uh, maybe just 10% of, of of that activity is uh, facilitated facilitated on a blockchain, then you're you're getting to some very interesting um, use cases uh, where the technology itself really impacts uh, mainstream and brings a lot of value uh, to the mainstream. Um, so we, we, we talk a lot about uh, trust in our project, uh, hub project, and uh, trust is really the underlying foundation of uh, the economy. And so that's why I believe that actually the blockchain has the potential to bring a lot of value uh, in the next few years uh, to uh, the mainstream uh, in terms of how we can enable people to have more trust and to uh, store their value uh, reputation data onto a blockchain. So uh, that's kind of the big idea. There's 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 many uh, many ways to engender trust on, on a blockchain, but I believe that's how we're going to be able to bring a lot of value and people onto the mainstream. Uh, to find out more, uh, this is our uh, project website. Uh, we have a project called Hub. Uh, a website, hubtoken.org, and a Telegram group as well. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eric. Next, we will be having a fireside chat with Mr. Adam Lundwin, who is the co-founder and CEO of Chain.com and Mr. Wei Jiebing, who is the founder and managing partner at Taiki Partners. Welcome. Welcome. Please, no, no applause, just send Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> send Ethereum. No. Yeah, well, first of all, welcome to the uh, PISA event. Great to see a lot of uh, new faces as well as uh, lots of old friends. Uh, as uh, you all know, PISA is a nonprofit organization and its mission is to foster entrepreneurship uh, in the Valley. So, you know, we put on uh, lots of events uh, throughout the year like this. Uh, obviously, we cannot make this happen without your participation, both as a participant, and I also like to encourage you to volunteer at Heisen. And uh, we will run by uh, volunteers. And I will assure you that uh, if you volunteer at Heisen, you you also learn a lot from process. And you know, I can honestly myself, I've been volunteer at Heisen for the last 10 years, and I have learned tremendously in the, in the process. So, uh, as a board member, that's the commercial for Heisen. Okay, now get to the uh, main topic about blockchain. Uh, and it turned out that this is the 10th anniversary for the first white paper published 10 years ago. And Adam, you know, for you as 
you know, I hate to use the word pioneer because you're so young, but your starch came five years ago. Give us a historical perspective. What was it like at that time? And how you started out, how you see the power chain ecosystem evolve in the last five years? Great, well thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, before I started Chain, I was uh, a VC investing in startups. And I happened to work for a fund after graduate school that was about 50% FinTech. But this was FinTech pre-crypto, cryptocurrency. Uh, and in 2011 or so, a friend of mine sent me uh, the Bitcoin white paper. And he sent it to me because he thought it was a startup fintech company that I could fund as a VC. He said, this is a cool deck. It's a little bit of a weird format, but maybe you can find Satoshi and give him the Series A or something. So I read the paper and uh, I quickly realized two things. One, uh, this is not a startup, uh, but two, it was, the it was entirely different from all the other fintech that our fund was looking at. And if you think about fintech outside of cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's basically a thin layer of application or user interface like Venmo or Square that sits on top of the existing financial stack. From government money to banks to credit cards and other networks and processors. And at the very top, you get this thin layer called FinTech, Credit Karma, all these companies. But it's all just making it bearable for normal people to use the existing system. Um, whereas Bitcoin was like a big red reset button that said, look, we've already got the internet, which connects everybody. What's the least we can add to it to get to a financial system and money? And it turns out that the answer was, you know, several thousand lines of code, and you're, you've got the start of something. Of course, um, it was also clear to me that the amount of time it would take to go from that concept to any sort of meaningful adoption and change was going to be years, if not decade plus. Um, so, you know, maybe at that point, investing in a company and hoping to use your term from earlier that the inflection point was only a couple of years away felt wrong. But given that I really believed in what I was seeing, as I learned more, I thought this is a great opportunity early in a career to really invest in something and be part of something and hopefully shape it. So that's how I got, got into this space. Very interesting. So I guess the advice for the VCs in audience is, you know, take the weird idea seriously. Absolutely. Surround. Yeah. In the, yeah. That's a good. That's a good summary. In the, uh, have a prepared mind. Seek out strange ideas, and then say, you know, realize most strange ideas are also bad ideas. But every once in a while, a strange idea is also a good idea or an important one. Yeah, one of the uh, most amazing things Chain had accomplished, which you know, for me as an observer, is that your partnership with Visa, you know, NASDAQ and so on. Let's take a Visa as an example. Um, you know, give us kind of an insider's perspective. You know, how does a Fortune 500 you know, is financial institute thinking about blockchain technology? And secondly, why the hell do they work with chain, which at the time less than 20 people that, you know, what, what do you bring to the table that they cannot fulfill otherwise? Yeah. Um, so l large financial institutions have become interested in the last few years uh, in, in this technology for two reasons. One it is the same reason every big company studies new technologies, which is a mix of fear of disruption and combined with hope of transformation and potential new business models they can create. And, uh, and the reason they worked with a company like Chain, which at the time was yeah, less than 20 people, was uh, there's no other option. <laughs> 
Wow, there's another option. Modest. No, it's true. Um, since then, you know, larger companies like IBM and Microsoft have kind of entered the space. But when we started to partner with uh, enterprises, uh, we were one of the only, if not the only option. And, and really, our marketing strategy, and I think this applies to anyone who's a small player wanting to work with big fish, uh, don't try to sell them. On, your, on a new technology, just teach them about it. And if you become known as the best teacher, then they'll want you to educate more people, and eventually they'll ask you to come teach the CEO about it, right? And when you teach the CEO about it, don't try to sell the CEO. Just explain it to her, and then at the end of the meeting, she will ask, okay, so what do you guys do again? <laughs> and of course, you'll have prepared an answer to that question. And you'll say, oh, it's well, I'm sorry, I didn't even think that we were going to talk about chain today. Right? And then you, you, you sell them on chain. No wonder. Not, not, not everything makes sense. You know, in the morning, we have a Professor Zhao from, uh, from Stanford giving a talk on blockchain. And uh, I guess the secret for an entrepreneur to be successful is to be a good teacher. Is that right? I, I think that's right. Uh, it, it, the other thing I want to say is, Blockchain is similar to other frontier technologies like AI and VR and robotics and drones and self-driving vehicles. Nobody really knows how these technologies are going to get commercialized yet. And actually it's a mistake to try to rush to commercialization. And so if you're a big company and you're choosing between working with someone like Chain versus working with a large consulting firm, you kind of know the mentality of the consulting firm. They want to sell you now on a solution now and start integrating it now. Uh, or they just want to you know, do a study with you, but they're not the experts in that thing. So I think the, the big companies have kind of figured out, when, with respect to frontier technologies, it's actually safer to work with startups who have an incentive to work toward the long term, toward the fundamentally interesting new things. Um, and uh, and that's, that's, that's basically the strategy that we, we pursued at the beginning. See, that's, that's another, bring up another good point, which, you know, I'm very impressed with chain, uh, in the sense that you're you know, one of the, not necessarily the word pioneer, you're one of the early players uh, uh, in, in the field, and there's obviously lots of hype, a lot of, let's call a lot of momentum, a lot of hype, uh, okay, a lot of hype, <laughs> uh, in the space, uh, yet, if you look at chain, you know, you didn't, Go, you're not going through a hyper growth, you're not chasing some of the you know, smoke out there, you're in all things considered being very, very grounded. Do you worry about missing the big wave? All the time? Or, yeah. or look, you know, as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, share what's your, what's your thinking process uh, in, in this kind of macro environment? Yeah. Um. It's, it's actually, it's a great question. It's very difficult to be a startup in a, a field as noisy and hype-driven as this one. Um, and I'm sure, again, that's true for other fields like augmented reality and, you know, uh, and AI, where there are a lot of opinions, a lot of divergent opinions, a lot of segmentation, a lot of debate and controversy. And most critically, uh, a very small amount of demonstrable impact and value yet uh, from this entire set of technologies. So if, you're, if you want to be in a space like this one, you have to be willing to uh, immerse yourself in all of the hype, in all of the noise, read everything, think about everything. You can't. You can't be myopic and ignoring what's going on. But then you have to um, have your own point of view and opinion and, and, and bet on yourself. And, and most importantly, um, you've got to assemble a team that you can talk through the strategy with. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you, and ultimately, you can't be chasing things. Right? If you're chasing, you're going to be too late. Someone does an ICO, oh, we should do an ICO. 
right? Well, did you think about why that made sense before you saw it, or do you just want what they have now? Um, so having conviction and then sticking to it and seeing it through, which is also difficult because oftentimes in a space like this, when you make a bet, you're gonna be early, and uh, that means that the world may not catch on right away. And you may think, oh, that means we're wrong. But oftentimes it just means, no, you work early and you just gotta stick, stick through it. So um, I don't recommend anyone work in this space. Uh, not because I don't want competition, but it's just a, it's a psychologically uh, draining thing to be an entrepreneur. Uh, but also to, to be an entrepreneur in a space that's this hyped. It's, it's quite challenging, but it's fun. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a very interesting comment, because uh, you know, since I've been around for a while, and the hype we're going through is much bigger, relatively speaking, compared to the internet level. Because if you look at the internet, there's you know, the bubble is bigger, but the usage is actually higher. Yeah, can I, can I build on that? Can we do an audience poll? Okay, everyone has to participate, okay? Um, if you were born between January and June, can you raise your hands? That should be half. If you were born between June and December, can you raise, July and December? Okay, that was just the warm up to get everyone comfortable raising their hand, okay? <laughs> Um, so, in the 90s, uh, it's 2018, okay, so let's go back 20 years, 1998, for those of you that were alive and sentient, how many of you uh, had heard of the internet in 1998? Okay, yeah. Uh, how many of you were, uh, had purchased a dot-com stock, like you made an investment in, in some internet company in the 90s? Okay, so the first answer is like most people, now fewer people. Um, and then how many of you were using the web in 1998 or using a personal computer? Every, you know, okay, great. So that was like the 90s, right? Most people had heard of it, some people had invested, but everyone was using it. Okay, so now it's 2018. How many of you have heard of Bitcoin? Okay. How many of you have purchased a cryptocurrency? Okay. Now, finally, you gotta put your hand down, you don't know my third question. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you uh, actively use Bitcoin for payments uh, in your life or in your business life? You did know my question, so two. <laughs> so th that's the fundamental difference from the 90s, which is, Everyone's heard of this new thing. Some people are investing. But, but in the 90s, everyone was also using these things. And now no, no one really is. And, and that's the fundamental challenge, question, what does it all mean? And some people will argue that uh, that was an unfair poll. That investing in Bitcoin is using it. Because it's like saying, how many people have purchased gold, and now how many of you are using gold? Well, I'm not using gold for anything other than investing. So if you think the end-all, be-all is just a digital gold, then that was a, then that was a unfair set of questions. But if you think there's something more profound, potentially, which is the ability to have money over IP and to move value over the internet, like the previous speaker was discussing, then we're still actually very far away. And it's not quite like the 90s right now. It's more like, you know, the late 70s maybe when the Homebrew Computer Club and Steve Wozniak were tinkering and inventing a whole new paradigm called personal computing. And we were still ways away from commercialization. The only reason there's a conference though, because you know, the, nobody cared about the Homebrew Computer Club at the time, except for the people in it. Um, and if that's the case, then you have to say, why do we have a conference? And the reason is because there's a word up here that says investment. In other words, the nature of this technology is that it's money. And so it attracts a capital markets environment around what is really still a nascent technology. And time will tell whether that will accelerate or stunt 
the growth of the technology. And so far, it feels like it accelerates it and then stunts it and accelerates it and then stunts it, and it feels like we're in a stunting mode right now. So it's, uh, anyway, it's, 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 a fun, it's a fun time to be an entrepreneur and to work in the space, but it can be very difficult. That's an interesting comment. So, you know, uh, uh, let's get back to the fundamentals, right? There's obviously a lot of discussions about, about blockchain, and honestly, I don't know how many people who really understand what blockchain is, uh, what it's good for. So maybe, you know, look at from a fundamental perspective, what blockchain technology is good for, yeah. as well as what blockchain is not good for. Yeah. So, I hate the word blockchain. <laughs> I hate the word blockchain. So, so that's um, why you drop the block but on the chain. Yeah. <laughs> don't. If I could go back, don't call your company chain, by the way. That's a bad idea. Um, Speaking anyhow. <laughs> so um, the word blockchain ha has two meanings that are very different. Like if I was Webster's Dictionary and I needed to do number one, number two, I would do number one, uh, a new database model that, uh, that is really designed for assets. So it, it's fundamentally, if you, if you look across every project and you say what unites them, you've got this new data structure, right? It's basically a, a, a mathy database with crypto in it. So it's a database, that's, that's definition one, very boring. Definition two is a counterculture. It's a sociological definition. It's, it's, it's a word that means we're going to disrupt the status quo with decentralization. Um, and whether the counterculture is against the internet incumbents like Facebook and Google or against the Wall Street incumbents like JP Morgan and Goldman, what unites a lot of the startups is taking aim at that incumbency. Um, but how could that be? How could a database technology power a counterculture? That doesn't seem to connect. And, and the answer is because it's a database technology that ena enables decentralization, enables us to uh, 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 create decentralized software models that don't require a central operator, don't require anyone to run them, um, and therefore can challenge these sort of traditional centralized players. Um, so that's, that's blockchain, but still it, it leaves us wanting for more. So the, when I start explaining this topic to folks, I usually start by defining cryptocurrency. Do you mind if I do that? Okay, so I think when you think cryptocurrency, uh, think new asset class, right? So, uh, and when you think asset class, like stocks, bonds, real estate, it's helpful to remember that other asset classes serve something else. Stocks don't exist for, in, a, in, a, in a vacuum for their own sake. They exist to support corporate organization, the corporate form, and fundraising for corporations, and ownership in corporations. Um, bonds, likewise, serve uh, borrowers, and real estate serves property owners, and so on. So what are cryptocurrencies serving? Like, what are they enabling above the actual asset class? And the answer is software a new type of software that's decentralized, or what are usually called decentralized applications, uh, which are these uh, uh, applications that don't have a central operator. And then you get to a more fundamental question, what good is that? What good is it to have a decentralized application? And finally, that's where I think you get to an interesting answer, which is uh, decentralized applications are censorship resistant. You cannot stop anyone from using them. You can't uh, 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 censor a transaction as long as the sender or the creator of that transaction uh, pays the appropriate fee and is connected to the network. And, um, and censorship resistance is very powerful. It's, it's so powerful that it's attracting people to use these services even though they're way worse than their traditional centralized counterparts. Like you cannot say that for everyone, Bitcoin is better than Visa or that Ethereum is better than cloud computing, or that Filecoin is better than uh, Dropbox. In fact, they're slower, they're uh, harder to use, they're more expensive, but because they're censorship resistant, it attracts folks who need that for a particular use case, 
And yes, that might mean that in the short term, those users uh, are unsavory, right? Uh, who needs censorship resistance? Oh, people think people that are creating ransomware, or people that are uh, trying to evade capital controls, or want to launder money, or or buy things they shouldn't be buying on the internet. But that's, I think, pretty short-sighted. I think the bigger opportunity, or the, a different way to think about it is, censorship resistant also means open, unfettered, and when you have an open system, the pace of innovation is much higher, and you'll see emergent things, new forms of value that will come out of that. And it's this new medium that will lead to essentially new categories of value and money that we haven't seen yet, but everyone working in the space is fundamentally interested in. And the ICOs of the last year, that was an example, even though most of them, I think a fair person would agree, are garbage. Uh, it still demonstrates a new form of capital formation that we've never had. So, so if you look at the, uh, you know, application where the value, where uh, the value being created, you know, at a high level, you can, you know, put into two categories. One is for enterprise, we call it B2B. Uh, the second is B2C for consumers, you know, average consumer. What's the, the two questions, what's the dynamics of computers? And uh, where do you think which category will emerge first? Right, so, yep, there's cryptocurrencies and there's sort of blockchain, right? Or DLT, uh, permissioned, private, and then public, open, etc. And I think that's been a helpful distinction insofar as uh, big financial institutions, enterprises, were not really willing to experiment or adopt public networks for a variety of reasons for the last few years. Um, number one, their governance is terrifying. Uh, if you imagine, for example, Starbucks issuing a points program onto Ethereum using that as the, as, the, as the medium for its program, then the network forks. Which Starbucks point is the point that they'll accept, right? So, uh, it's just a very, or another, carrying that forward an example, does Starbucks want everyone in the world to know the total circulation and, and transaction volume of their points program? Uh, no. Uh, uh, so, by the way, I don't think Starbucks points on Ethereum is a good idea. It's just an easy one to, to think about. And, and so the, the, the enterprise use cases didn't fit, and the networks weren't really designed for existing assets. And so you saw the rise of this essentially private blockchain effort. Companies like ours, R3, IBM has a project called Fabric, where the concept is let's create protocols that suit enterprises and essentially private networks of their counterparties have the privacy and scalability that they need for those use cases. And that was, I think, the right chapter for the last couple of years to get institutions familiar with, these, with, the, with the paradigm. But I think where we're going over the next few years is going to be a convergence between these enterprise projects and institutions and public networks for two reasons. The enterprises are ready. They're starting to uh, understand the technology thanks to these private projects and understand where the potential is. And the public networks have uh, improved on the attributes that three or four years ago made it impossible to use them. In other words, they're scaling, starting to scale. They're starting to become more multi-asset possible, right? So networks like Ethereum and Stellar, where you can issue any asset on top. Um, uh, the, there are increasing breakthroughs in terms of speed of transactions. There are breakthroughs in terms of privacy. So the technology is improving, the enterprises are more comfortable, and I think at the end of the day it makes sense for um, enterprises, when they're transacting inside their own organization between customers, to do that on private ledgers. But then when they're moving assets between organizations and they need interoperability to do that over open networks instead of proprietary ones. Yeah, following on that, so if I were a 
Fortune 500 company, and uh, you know, looking at exposed copying blockchain technologies. You know, obviously, this is different than five years ago, where you probably only game in town. So you find the CIO of XYZ company. What should, what should I look for? You know, in who to work with. Obviously, if you're on IP, you can do it internally. How do they go through the selection process? That would be beneficial. Yeah, so the number one problem, uh, <laughs> let me put this way. When a big institution comes to chain, they're still asking the wrong question, which is some version of, we want to do something with blockchain, can you help us? And then I say, what, is, what do you mean you want to do something with blockchain? What's your problem? And oftentimes their problem is that their boss said, go do something with blockchain, and they got to do something with blockchain. Or they read a, you know, they're the boss, and they read a report from an industry analyst that said blockchain is coming, and then now they're running to do something with blockchain. So, number one thing is don't do that. You know, understand what it is, and then think about whether it's a tool that makes sense to solve the problem. Um, but number two, I think what I said earlier still applies today. In other words, four years ago when we were meeting Visa and NASDAQ for the first time, we were teaching them about the state of the art. Um, today, when we're meeting with a large institution, the meeting with us versus the meeting with, I won't name a company, but a, a large technology company, is going to still feel the way it felt. In other words, the large technology company is going to be telling the client things that I told them three or four years ago, because they're catching up to that. And the meeting with me is going to be feel very different, because I'm going to say, here are all the reasons those things maybe do or don't make sense, and here's what we're doing now, and here's where the future is. So I think startups continue to have the advantage in these frontier spaces as long as their innovation is faster. So that, that won't change until we get to broad commercialization, which is still clearly years away. That's great. I just want to make sure I want to save some time for Q&A from the audience. So get your questions ready. Uh, I'll ask one last question before I open the floor. Uh, the last question is, uh, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, Heist's mission is about entrepreneurship in the Valley. You know, as an entrepreneur in this space, what advice would you have to the entrepreneurs in the audience? What you do as well is what not to do. Uh, the other end, don't start. <laughs> Since that could take 30 minutes, I'll give one answer, Great. which is find yourself an amazing co-founder or a set of co-founders that you can work well with and trust and compliment you, uh, both at work and at home. You have to have a ton of support in both places if you're going to do a startup. Uh, otherwise, something will break. So that's probably 80% of success. And then everything else is just hard work, I think. That's great. I can definitely testify to that. <laughs> the questions? What's the positive relationship between the equity of the company versus the token? The relationship between the equity and the token of a company? So. Uh, I think everyone, of course, knows what equity is, but a token is not a, typically not a, uh, a claim on the corporate entity at all, and typically it's not a loan. And this is what's been so attractive about the ICO model. It's people give you money, and you don't have to pay them back, and they don't own any of your company. And they're giving you money only because <laughs> The thing you're giving them, they think they can sell to someone else for more money. Uh, and so, and that, that was the, the that was most projects over the last 18 months. Increasingly, I think people are wondering: Is there some sort of equity token that can be essentially a new medium for more of a traditional private company stock? And but if you look at a company like Ripple, for example. If you hold XRP, you have no claim on the company. And if you have equity in the company, you have no participation in the, in the XRP. So they're just diff different, different instruments. 
the relative which is more valuable? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think I think I understand the question. I would answer it this way: If you could choose between investing in a cryptocurrency or investing in like a blockchain startup, like what historically has been a better investment? Direct investment in cryptocurrency over time, so far. Um, but there are companies in the space who are worth a lot of money now too. So I, I think they they're different return profiles, different asset classes. Great, we are out of time. Uh, thanks for your time, uh, Adam. Uh, thanks for sharing your insight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. Coming up next, we have a very interesting panel discussion on how to identify the value of token. And we will, before I introduce the speakers, please allow me to uh, introduce the, the interaction app that we're using for this conference. So I do, I do uh, understand a lot of you uh, might wish to raise questions to the speakers on stage. So if you can find the QR code on your agenda on the bottom right of the paper, you can scan it with your WeChat or iPhone camera or other apps. And uh, once you scan the code, you will be entering an interface. And then please choose join discussion. And then once you log in, you'll be able to send questions to the speakers. And uh, during the last five minutes for each panel discussion, we will uh, the moderator will be asking questions, the most likes or the most asked questions from the app. If you don't have any questions, you always feel free to like questions so that the, your favorite questions will get asked. All right, so let me introduce the panel speakers for our next panel. Uh, Lucille Hu from FBG Capital. Mr. Scott Robinson from Plug and Play Fintech. Mr. Paul Veradictaki from Pantera Capital. And uh, Mr. Zhu Xiaohan Zhu uh, from ZMT Capital. And this panel will be moderated by Mr. Keith Tier from Accelerated Digital Ventures. Welcome. Hey, everybody. That, that was a really pathetic clap, I just, just want to say that. You're probably all tired, right? So we're going to wake you up. Just to the, let's start with a poll. Hands up if you lost money buying tokens. Lost money. Hand up if you made money. Actually, it's pretty even. Hands up if you never invested in buying tokens. Quite a few. Okay, so we, we're going to educate this audience. Do you guys want to quickly introduce that by 30 seconds each, just so we don't take all the time? Why don't we start with, um, I'm going to say the name, Jiao Hu. Jiao Han. Jiao Han. Yeah. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jiao Han. So, I'm the uh, partner for uh, ZFT Capital. So, we actually invested uh, as a traditional VC fund uh, starting in 2016. Uh, at that time, we one of our major focuses was FinTech. So, we started getting invested into quite a few blockchain companies. And in 2017, a lot of these launching companies uh, started ICOs. And that's how we get into cryptocurrency and ICO space. And uh, things have been changing really fast since then. And uh, we invested in a couple of uh, pretty interesting projects and uh, had pretty good returns on these projects as well. And also learned uh, a lot during the process and also made a lot of friends uh, uh, with the uh, people in the ecosystem. So, it would be great to, to share ourselves uh, in this uh, panel discussion. Hi, my name is Paul and I'm with Pantera Capital. And Pantera Capital was started in 2012 by Dan Moorhead. He used to be at Tiger Management, one of the world's largest hedge funds. So Pantera has been investing in crypto since then and has been focused exclusively on, on, on that. So we have four different strategies. We invest in Bitcoin, uh, which is our earliest fund. We also have a venture capital fund. We also have an ICO fund that invests in just pre-sales. And then we also have a quant fund that uses data to algorithmically trade cryptocurrencies on the secondary markets. Uh, manage anywhere from 600 to $800 million. And I've been in the space since early 2014. Really got excited about blockchain after reading some articles on blockchain and also uh, you know, reading the white paper. So I've been doing this for about four years now, focused on both venture and ICOs. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Robinson. I sit on the board of Plug and Play Tech Center, a, a global startup accelerator and investor. 
Um, in 2012, I ran across a couple articles in the white paper of Bitcoin and began showing up at the local Silicon Valley Bitcoin meetup that Roger Ver ran. Um, so it was about 15 of us, and from there, when Roger left the country, I took it over, launched a small Bitcoin accelerator program, while it was uh, a key help alongside of Pinter, and we did about 20 investments in the space. Uh, so companies that you would know include Civic, Stellar, uh, some new ones like Nuco and Block Damon, Factum, etc. Uh, but plug and play has been investing for the past 20 years. Companies that you might know from that side of the world is uh, PayPal, Money Club, and a few hundred more. Uh, hi, my name is Nasil Hu. I'm with a fund called FBG Capital. Um, FBG has always been a digital assets focused hedge fund, and we started in 2015. Um, we do trading as well as ICO investing, and we currently have about 80 companies in our portfolio, so uh, the topic today about valuation is something we think about a lot. And I'm Keith Teer. I, am a, I run a $200 million venture fund out of the UK called ADV. Uh, I've been an advisor to a whole bunch of ICOs. Probably ones you've heard of would be ICO Box, Criterium, and quite a few others. And uh, I am doing an ICO for something called Venture Network which is the first um, non-crypto fund venture play. You'll have to go read about it at VentureNetwork.io. Today we're going to talk about uh, what is the value of a token is the, is the title, which is kind of a, gen a generic title. Let's assume for the purpose of the discussion, tokens and coins is the same word used in different ways. And let's try, it sounds like there's some pretty basic questions for the audience in the last session. Let's start by just getting down to the roots of it. How could you even think about what the value is in the token? What are the criteria when Pantera invests or when you guys invest? What, what are you thinking about? And just jump in, I'm not going to pick you, so whoever wants to go first can jump in. All right, I'll jump in. Um, I think there's, I mean, first and foremost, there's not a lot different from the concept of traditional diligence when it comes to looking at an opportunity. And I think a lot of people kind of shy away from the concept of looking over what the team looks like, the product itself, where are they in the general development schedule. Um, so a lot of those ancillary questions that, you know, in one way or another can't necessarily be answered should, in one way or another, be a red flag to you as you're looking at a token. Um, but to that end, I think there's probably three major ways you might look at a token or, or some sort of ICO offering. And I think number one is uh, generally the metrics as it relates to the value of the token. Where is it being distributed? What is the type of offering as it's related from pre-sale to full sale? Um, so the question of circulation, volume, or transaction. Um, that's maybe one area. Um, the second certainly would be the strategic relationships behind it. So often, I think we're looking for what kind of distribution channels do they have? Have they made a you know, relationship with a number of exchanges? Are there lockup periods behind it? And I guess third is the obvious utility of it. What is the actual function of this? Can this be achieved outside of a token requirement? And so the small tea leaves that we look for perhaps in a white paper, for example, would be how much focus is there on the specific sale function as opposed to the actual product. And those are very you know, straightforward indicators of the purpose behind, I think, an ICO. Um, but at a very high level, I think you know, there are a lot of challenges for us in, in assessing this, and this is a very new space to be assessing it to, to begin with. And there's a lot of, uh, I think, vectors outside of what the value you might look at um, with those parameters that can be impacted. So for example, you know, Adam kind of alluded to this earlier, you can imagine Starbucks having uh, you know, two versions of an Ethereum token out in the market, um, what happens when CryptoKitties you know, attacks you know, the bandwidth offering and, and therefore our ERC-20 token might have a little bit more difficult time um, transacting over the network. So there's a lot of different areas there that I think do not apply from the traditional perspective. Okay, anyone else want to disagree or agree or say something different? So um, I have a, both an engineering and finance background. So I've been really thinking about because when I went to uh, the business school, like uh, the finance, finance professor, proper finance professor, the, one of the major things that he was talking about was the value of a company is creating shareholder values, right? Maximizing the shareholder values. So what does that apply for tokens? So there's a, uh, one kind of news uh, that uh, really attracts my attention uh, the last couple of days. Uh, the biggest uh, ride-sharing company, Didi, in China, uh, they lost only uh, in three days. They lost 30% uh, market share to another company called Meituan in Shanghai market. One of the reasons for that was uh, um, once they DD already got the monopoly uh, position in China after they kicked out uh, Uber. So after that, they have been manipulating the price, uh, basically trying to jack up the price for the uh, 
for the riders uh, without uh, passing the value to the drivers. So that uh, really makes me think about the, the whole, whole thing. Because, for example, the modern shareholder system, the modern corporate structure, uh, started uh, at the Industrial Revolution time. At that time, our um, economy is more like a manufacturer-driven economy. So at that time, in order to, um, there is a direct conflict between the labor force and the factory owners. In order to alleviate that, uh, basically, the shareholder system was created and they aligned the incentive of the uh, shareholders um, and the investors, the owners, and the labor force. So with that uh, uh, interest alignment, we can say, uh, in order to maximize the company value, it's all about uh, maximizing all the shareholders. But uh, in a service uh, economy, like we're currently experiencing, I mean, a lot of times, uh, these folks uh, basically were dealing with information, dealing with marketplaces. For these companies, uh, in order for them to maximize the entire ecosystem, because their uh, stakeholders are no longer just uh, uh, the entrepreneurs, the, their employees, their investors. For example, in the uh, ride-sharing case, there's drivers and uh, there's passengers as well. If you just want to maximize the value for the first three groups, I mean, you definitely will squeeze out uh, other two groups. So that's not the best way to maximize the entire ecosystem. So now I look at ICO as more um, a social economic change based on um, what's our current economic structure. So um, this is not uh, just um, maximizing the value for the uh, for a company, but it's more like a optimizing the value, maximizing value for the entire ecosystem. So if you look at uh, what uh, I mean, what's the underlying value for the token at the end of the day? It's uh, how much activity, how much uh, transactions uh, you stimulate in your ecosystem. So that's uh, I mean, how we look at value right now. It's interesting. I'm, I'm a, a partly an economics major, and uh, I'm old enough. I, I went to college in 1974 in England, and in England in 1974, you had to read Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Uh, we read both. Now, interestingly enough, they both agree on what value is. Um, so the capitalist economist Adam Smith and the Karl Marx both agree that value actually is the embodiment of human labor. That is to say, it's the when we all work and we create either products or services and we get money, that money is the embodiment of the value that we created. So a token has to somehow trace itself back to a, a body of activity, a body of effort, a body of work, and the value somehow has to be related to that. Do you see that happening? I mean, I mean, give, give some both some good stories maybe and some bad stories of what you're seeing in token economics. Pitches you see that you say no to, other ones you say yes to, and try to give the audience a sense of what the difference is. Yeah, I mean, um, just to help, you know, the way that we think about things, Similar to similar to Scott, I mean, like, you know, does this token make, uh, does this token actually make sense within a certain ecosystem? Is it really going to be used? Is it the only sort of value that's going to be residing within the ecosystem versus uh, making revenue any other way? And then, uh, I guess going past that, you know, there's there's social uh, sort of value that you've seen from again going out there marketing, creating a lot of uh, sort of sort of investor, you know, confidence, investor hype. And then of course the the economic value of basically, you know, are they are they actually having a product that is being used by users? Are they producing transactions within a certain ecosystem? Um, you know, right now it's 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 hard to do any sort of uh, evaluation of that. You can take a look at the sort of the social um, metrics, but you know at the end of the day the way that we do valuations is we look at the type of company and the great thing is we've invested into quite a few companies and we've seen a lot of companies so we can actually segment whether it's at the infrastructure level, whether it's at the platform level or whether it's at the application level and then what segment within each of those uh, a certain company falls within and then we actually do comps just like, uh, just like anybody else and we do comps on private markets, we do comps on companies that are already out there and we see sort of where they're valued at and where they could be valued at in the future. And then later on, I mean, determining whether to hold on to a position over time, 
then you just start turning into a, uh, a hedge fund, and then you and, that, and then hopefully over time you're able to analyze you know how these companies are doing based off of their sort of economic metrics. And we haven't really seen a lot of that yet. You know, it is really just based off of speculation of what value these companies can and sort of create over time. So Lucille, um, you're in digital asset management. Some would say hedge fund. Normally, that is a pretty value sensitive form of investing. Yes. Um, so something that's interesting about investing in the digital asset space is that there's a liquidity event that happens in a much shorter time frame than it would in the traditional economy. Once a token gets listed on an exchange, people can buy and sell and cash out and kind of do whatever they want. Um, so in that, in that sense, it can be easy, it can be simpler to um, sort of tie the value of the token to what the team is doing if you're keeping track of whether a team is hitting milestones, releasing updates when they promise to. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these updates don't represent full implementations. It's still like a partial implementation or some kind of a, um, like a test. So even in maybe the most concrete um, case where there's a valuation offered by the market, it's not necessarily, um, it's hard to say that that's the true value of, of the labor right. behind an effort. Just out of interest, did any of you invest in the Telegram ICO so far? <laughs> you don't have to disclose if you can't, but, but I'm gonna guess some of you did. So I, I've heard stories there where I think it was 32 cents the first batch, 32 or 37, I forget, but it was like way less than a dollar. And what, what I've been seeing out there, and there was a lock-in for 12 months or 18 months, I think, for those people. And I've seen um, multiple sales uh, where the people who bought at 32 cents, even though they were locked in, were able to sell pretty much straight away at 50 cents. And those people who bought the riots at 50 cents also sold at like, 77 cents, all the way up to 137 cents, which was the second phase of the ICO. So you get the sense that... But with no lock-up requirement. Yeah, um, they didn't do a whole lot of human labor to make that money, that's for sure. So I'm, what I'm sensing is that there's two separate things going on in here. I'd love you guys to try to unravel them. One is a profound long-term shift in where value is stored. And the second is a short-term flipping mentality to make money quick. Now, obviously, everyone wants to make money. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the short-term view. But how do you think about the short-term and the long-term? I mean, what would get you to buy a token and hold it for 18 months versus what would make you never do that and want to flip? Maybe that's a good question. A good, it's kind of a personal question, so I'm assuming you're speaking on your own behalf, not on, the, on your firm's behalf, but how do you think about those things? Any, anyone? Maybe I could throw out kick versus civic, and the mindset behind that. So we did not invest in the civic, or excuse me, the kick um, ICO. The point is, is, from what we see in the traditional market trends as it relates to you know, a messaging service and uh, the convergence towards a payment peer-to-peer -peer function that we've seen in Alipay, Baidu, et cetera, elsewhere, where peer-to-peer -peer payments on the messaging app seem to be kind of where most folks are headed. Um, so there the thesis is just generally market market trend. Uh, Kick makes sense. We think there's a long-term value there. Um, I can understand the utility of having some sort of information tailored with that. I know there's challenges at SKU level when it comes to traditional payments. So a lot of interesting things can come from that, and therefore there's a long tail as it relates to it. Um, you contrast that to something like Civic where uh, there was a product in market. Um, it was a very simple product. It was coming from a founder that we had worked with in the past. We had seen an exit to first data. Um, he was addressing the significant issue of uh, GIF, GYFT, this is Vinny Lingham, of course, of uh, fraud as it relates to your credit card um, and swapping on you know, the, the gift card uh, platform that he sold. And so we knew this was a dear challenge for him because he's experienced it firsthand. And secondly, we felt like the method for which they were rolling out the process effectively referencing onboarding solutions across all of onboarding and housing that locally on your device, that seemed like a very unique offer. So for us, it was more boom shot, right? And I think, you know, the two caveats with that is number one, Q 
Kick's been around for a while, has a significant user base, simply pivoting into this, leveraging the utility of the utility token, versus, say, Vinny and Civic, which has a significant promise, a very new, brand new way of looking at identity, how it might work on the device level. So those two things paired, I think, are very different from, say, a green entrepreneur that is working on a boiling the ocean challenge, a complete full infrastructure play, they're going to do mobile banking, they're going to do an exchange. I mean, there's a lot of indicators from the tried and true entrepreneur building a product and then leveraging something like a token versus those that I think are jumping on the bandwagon. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's very important for us to understand the purposes and intent behind how the pre-sale functions. And Vinny, in this case, he was very public and very democratized as it relates to his sale. And I think that was a very important caveat yeah. there. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, so um, this is this is probably a little more personally though. I'll start off with the funds thesis. The funds thesis is the five into sales and companies that we think are going to be disruptive over a decade. You know, it's going to take a long time to make these disruptions, whether it's at the infrastructure level or whether it's at the application level. I think the reasons to sell sometimes are going to be, you know, portfolio management, right? I mean, I think there's things that happen where you need to balance your portfolio. Um, I think in terms of how I look at things, um, if it is something like a kick where there's an existing product and the token fits in with an existing product and can be used right away, you can kind of already see how the token's going to be doing right off the bat. Um, it's more of a, I guess, going with a uh, centralized system right off the bat where you don't necessarily need companies and applications to be building on top of it to see the use of the token versus if we're investing into something that's going to be competing with Ethereum, that technology, to, to get that right and to not only get it scalable and also secure is going to take a little bit more time. And not only do you have to get that uh, technology and product built, but you actually have to have companies building on top of it and actually using those functions, like you know, a new smart contract language, um, you know, governance, etc. So that's going to take more, you know, two to three years, um, you know, or something like a, you know, a file coin or something where you know it's the the te it, the technology is is completely new and you have to build an ecosystem around it and people to contribute resources before you can actually have applications being built on top of it. So it really depends on the type of company and where it fits into the stack. But nevertheless, I mean, for the most part, we are long-term holders. Let's move along and just slightly change the question. So um, the, the SEC obviously thinks that all tokens are securities, or at least, quote, I've never seen one that isn't, unquote. Um, the Swiss government, on the other hand, recently gave a declaration that it sees four different kinds of tokens in the market. Uh, it said payment tokens, utility tokens, security tokens, and hybrids uh, that, are, that have elements of two or three of those in them. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a trend towards um, asset-backed tokens. That is to say, somebody says, let's say the 49ers said we're going to issue the 49er coin for 10 years worth of tickets in the stadium. And uh, the only way you can buy these tickets now is to use the coin. And it's the way of accelerating revenue from 10 years into the present and getting a bunch of cash in the bank today. Um, how do you think about the different types of tokens? Ignoring the SEC, which I think will eventually change its mind. Let's not get down there. How do you think of value as it as it applies to different types of tokens. Any, anyone, Lucille, I'm going to force you to go next because you haven't had time to think about it, which means you're going to say what you really think. <laughs> you know, I think, I think this is a tough question to answer because I don't think there's really a, a bright line distinction between the different types of tokens, whether they're, um, in most cases, whether they're Securities or utilities or asset backed or or um, or or whatever um, and so in other words, for you, that's not the criteria. There's other criteria you're looking at. No, currently, whether a token is a security or not is not is not a key criteria. It's um, do you care about the domicile like? Let's say it's a U.S. Yes. company versus, let's say, a British Virgin Islands company. Talk yes. about that. Yes. So, 
typically we invest only in uh, companies domiciled out of Singapore or Switzerland or governments with a more um, experimental uh, position on, on cryptocurrencies. But right now our focus really is more on the underlying technology um, as well as the upside and the strength of the community. Um, in terms of how we think about how regulatory bodies are trying to impose frameworks on cryptocurrency, we're really taking more of a flexible wait and see position. Um, my, my personal opinion is that I, I doubt any government is really anti-technology. And I, I doubt any you know, governing body would try to um, really slow the pace of their fintech development down, but there are a lot of other issues that governments have to legislate around, like protecting retail investors who don't really know what they're putting money into and, and capital flight. And, there's a great history of uh, the competition between city-states and emerging nations um, centuries ago where wars were fought over which currency was going to be used. So you can never assume governments will be nice. <laughs> yeah, actually it's funny that uh, um, since everything is called cryptocurrencies, right? Why the question is, uh, do you think uh, there are real currencies instead of securities, right? But the answer is obviously no. I mean, just like uh, the poll we did uh, like in the previous session, only two people out of the entire uh, crowd is actually using Bitcoin as a payment. So at the end of the day, like uh, these uh, so-called cryptocurrencies either becoming a digital goal or a new form of, uh, uh, I would say, social economic uh, representations. I mean, they're probably not uh, the securities that we're talking about today, but uh, it's the beginning of something completely new. And last time when this happens is like 200 years ago when the stock market was created. So, I mean, if we talk about valuation, um, right now most of the valuation is built on expectations. Expecting these things uh, will grow uh, significantly in the future. Um, and uh, all the comps are based on that as well. And when the market uh, expands or contracts, I mean, the, ex the comps will change as well. So, but, uh, I mean, the reason for people to put so much hype behind it uh, is that it definitely represents something very significant in our society. So, although right now we don't have a clear formula other than comps uh, to talk about values, but, uh, I mean, I believe intrinsically there are values involved. It just takes time for people to build, uh, like, people build modern financial theory based on like, maximizing shareholder value. There are similar ways uh, you need to build value system for tokens as well. It just takes time and uh, more academic research. A lot of the audience questions are asking us to talk about uh, the value of tokens beyond the general interest in decentralization. Um, I, I, just just to, to put tokens in the context of history a little bit, and being British kind of helps here. The, the, the pound used to be the global reserve currency um, between the wars, before the wars. Then, you know, the British Empire faded and the rise of both Germany and America originally led to two world wars while they figured out who the winner was. Uh, and eventually the dollar as the reserve currency. Today, uh, the dollar is weakening. China is clearly going to be, with India, the leader of the world at some point, but the Chinese currency probably isn't going to become the reserve currency anytime soon, because that usually never happens. Even the dollar could become the reserve currency very quickly without two more wars happening. So gold usually is what the world turns to when national currencies fail them. Is it possible that digital plays a role of a reserve currency between nations? Is that, there's a store of value, is that enough for crypto to be valuable? Or does it have to become a means of exchange where we actually buy cars and houses with it? Well, I mean, just 40,000 foot view of what ICOs represent, I mean, number one, to the startup, uh, 
I can choose the time, location, how much I'm raising from anyone in the world. That's a big difference from what it was 10, 15 years ago. You can imagine how many times they prayed down Sand Hill, knocked on doors, met the wrong person, wasn't there, and so for whatever reason, the thing didn't work out, didn't get the deck sent over, wrong email. A lot of different ways that these challenges occurred. So the, the, the value of having the ability to raise money from anywhere is pretty significant, particularly on the timing of their, of their needs. Secondly, it creates you know, a very interesting engagement model for your consumer base, right? So you have a direct line now, hypothetically, to your consumer that might be using your product over time. And then third, to the investor, um, you can imagine, I mean, outside of the lockup periods, what kind of risks now I can look at. I have liquidity, so I have the ability then to move quicker or, or slower as it may relate to something like this. So fundamentally, this is a pretty significant shift in value proposition to the process of creating a company and the capital behind it. And I think the reason why this is real is because folks like NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, major exchanges around the world began projects like these four or five years ago, understanding the implications of having a direct line, an ICO, to a market, what is their value prop now? And I think it's a very similar concept of going upstream. If your water is cut from you upstream, you're not going to get anything to your farm if you're three farms down the road. So um, we've only got like three minutes left. Does anybody want to ask a question so that you can uh, the floor can speak? Anybody? Hands up. I can't see. No. Yes. I think the answer is no. So we'll keep going. So what are you going to invest in next? Invest next. Uh, actually, uh, I'm working on a product. Come on, tell us. We all want to buy some. <laughs> so, yeah. So, if I invest, I will invest my own project. Yeah. Any, anyone? What, what are you looking for? What, what do you want to walk through the door and present to you? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest in this project, actually. <laughs> um, you know, we're similar to FBG. I mean, we are, you know, especially when markets are, are down like this, I mean, you know, it makes sense for us to continue to search for longer term projects. That means that uh, we've come across a few different projects either trying to compete with Ethereum or trying to compete with Bitcoin. Ethereum in terms of a new smart, con smart contract language, being able to maybe even have privacy and maybe have better throughput. And then of course maybe some other solutions to try to help scale those different blockchains a little bit more on the equity side. Um, we're continuing to look at applications. We've we invest in quite a few applications already, and for us, applications mean things where we think make a lot of sense for decentralization, whether it's helping to accelerate or expand markets, so focusing on heavily regulated industries or marketplaces that have incumbents that are taking you know, very high fees. Uh, something else that I'm really interested in, and I think we're going to make a, a couple of investments pretty soon in, are, like you mentioned, security tokens, access to that tokens. Uh, we actually think that that could be even much larger than utility tokens. Uh, utility tokens are fun, and personally, I like investing in utility tokens because it is it is like gambling. But nevertheless, um, uh, looking at security tokens, they are evaluating them very similar to venture investments. And uh, the reason why we're excited about them is the fact that you can actually bring the liquidity to very sort of oh, sorry liquidity to very illiquid markets and actually open up new investment classes. So things around like uh, tokenizing. Stop that, stop that. Yeah. Because we've only got like one minute left and, <laughs> and Lucille wants to say something. Actually, all of Paul's points were great and we're actually, like FPG looking um, closely into quite a few of those segments as well. Um, me personally, I would be interested in a very easy to use wallet where users don't need to worry about their private keys, don't need to, you know, like come online type something a hardware wallet. I think that um, is a key bottleneck to maybe having broader cryptocurrency adoption and that would also be an application that a lot of protocols would be interested in having um, building on top of their platform. Okay, we've got to wrap. Um, if you are interested in asset-backed tokens that address the problem of liquidity, venturenetwork.io, go take a look. Thank you to all of you, the great panel. Great audience, thank you, and we'll move along. Thank you. Thank you, guys, that was great. Thank you, Keith. And next, we will be having a panel discussion on trading or investing days or years uh, vision with Mr. Ron Tao from Skyline Capital, Mr. Yong Liu from Reku, Mr. Henry Xu from Link VC. 
uh, Mr. Eugene Zhang from TSVC, and this panel will be moderated by Ms. Jen Cao from JLab of JD Capital. Uh, before we proceed, uh, please allow me to remind you again that you can send your questions uh, by scanning the QR code on the agenda, join the discussion, and log in. Um, you can send your questions to the moderator. And for the um, you can see the questions on the screen, so feel free to check the screen anytime for the most liked questions. All right, let's welcome the speakers. Welcome. This is Jen from JLab of JD Capital, and this will be a very interesting panel. So, um, because a lot of there is a lot of uh, situation happening between trading and investing. So, previously the panel name is trading or investing, but actually I suggest that we should do it at the same time. So, which is title into trading and investing. So, let's let the um, speakers to introduce. Uh. My name is Patrick. Uh, we are a cryptocurrency exchange based in Tokyo and, uh, and, and Seoul in South Korea. We have license in uh, South Korea and we are applying license in, in Japan. We also have license in, uh, in Europe, some area in Europe as well. Uh, I think today I saw the portfolio of speaker most of them are from the uh, venture capital background. I, I myself are from the exchange, so I'm kind of unique right here. So, but I think I could add some value to this panel. Hi, uh, I'm Eugene Zhang, uh, founding partner of TSBC and uh, Teak Angel Fund, uh, micro VC fund in uh, Silicon Valley for the last seven and a half years. Uh, I represented the, the investing side, not the trading side. Hello everyone, um, my name is Ron Cao. I am a um, partner with Skyline Capital. Uh, as they say in China, we're a Gudian Tongzi Jijin. It's a classic venture capital firm uh, in this setting. So we invest mostly in equity, um, but um, but since 2013, we've been investing in blockchain and crypto-related uh, deals. And um, you know, uh, looking back, it was actually pretty early, uh, and now um, things are booming. And I think there's a lot of interesting questions for us, classic VCs, um, you know, that we need to deal with in terms of how you structure deals, how you look at crypto versus equity, um, what's the mix, and how do we, um, you know, how do we go forward uh, in this sort of uh, Brave new world in some ways. Hello, everyone. My name is Harry Xu, the venture partner of LiquidC. Uh, Liquid Venture Capital is a, a token fund founded by Jia Tong Li in 2016 in Singapore. Yeah. And uh, we have quarter in Singapore, but we also have offices in uh, Hong Kong, uh, Beijing, and the United States. Uh, we focus on uh, investing in uh, blockchain technology, uh, 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 fintech, and the cryptocurrencies. Uh, last year, we already invested, invested in more than 50 uh, projects of blockchain uh, all over the world. Yeah. Yes. yeah, a little bit information about myself. I come from traditional investing as well as some of our panelists. And now I joined JD Capital, which is one of the largest private equity group in China, and we have a blockchain vertical called JLab. So we actually actively invest for uh, over 30 blockchain companies in Asia, Switzerland, and now in the US as well. So we have a team of 20, and some of them are investment bankers background, and some of them do trading previously, and now we also have a trading team, and on the investment side as well. So, um, I traveled back to China two weeks ago around um, Spring Festival and then actually I generated a lot of really interesting conversation. I, back in Beijing, I was in some, like some top tier funds 
um, Sequoia, Matrix, and Jim Fund actually actively looking into this space. So a lot of our panelists come from the traditional uh, venture background. I wanna, um, the first is, I'm wondering what is the pivot point and why did you make the blockchain um, investment decision before the cryptocurrency taking off? Eugene. Okay, I, let me run it here. So, uh, yeah, we uh, started investing in the blockchain actually pretty early on, 2013. We lucky we invest in the biggest uh, exchange, uh, you know, crypto exchange in Taiwan right now. Uh, so that was back in 2013. So sitting from, uh, you know, as an investor in equity for many years, I uh, look at the crypto space, very, very exciting, uh, but also, uh, the previous panel, a lot of people actually. The last time when I organized a panel uh, in here also, but uh, the discussion quickly uh, get to trading. It's very natural. Uh, that when that, that uh, maybe three months ago was uh, very high, so it's like uh, making money. Uh, that's uh, pretty simple. Um, so with this reset in the big picture, my personal view is it's a great time. I think uh, uh, you know from a few ways to look at it, the big picture. So if you, um, previous panel, uh, the, the model you ask, you know, if you do it. So today you buy 50 cents, tomorrow you sell 75 cents, and then the, the day after you, you sell at one dollar, that kind of thing, I think for sure, 100% for sure, it, it will stop. It doesn't make sense. But nobody can make this kind of money in the pattern in a lasting uh, way. So I think uh, my personal view is about the market is it is uh, uh, getting to a build time you know, phase, um, the quick money has been has been made. Um, you know, from back to the 90s, right? If all the IPO companies um, they have eyeballs, but very quickly investors realize eyeball has to connect to value creation. I think that there's no exception here. Uh, um, you know, this is the same. Uh, would be the going forward would be the same. Uh, although. In the opportunities, they are. I participate in quite a few ICOs, tokens. I, I do get a, a pulse on the market. Clearly, right now, we are in the reset mode. And then the next phase is building companies, creating value. Another, another data point is um, I've seen so many companies that they, they run um, community, right? I think, you know, on um, Telegram, all that stuff. I think it, it, the next chapter is going to be uh, you, need, you need to do more. If you build a company creating value, you need to do more than a Telegram community. I think uh, I think a lot of companies just are happy with uh, building community. That's not enough. I think it's a great new thing. Um, it should be more than that, and also more than checking code. The previous speaker also mentioned checking code. Maybe three months ago, just checking code is good enough. Have a new release. To pump your stock uh, and the token that not stock. So that was, I think, uh, I just don't believe the next phase will be like you're checking the code. The army engineer checking code. What does it mean? How does it tie to the to the product and create a customer traction? I mean, just checking code, the, the token could just jump. I think it does not make too much sense. But I think that the market is going to get interested. Uh, the next phase. So, um, you know, Sky and I, we focus on China uh, investments. We raise about $200 million every three years or so. And uh, we deploy about $500 million in China over the last 10 years. And so far, it's been a, you know, small fraction uh, in crypto, uh, less than, for sure, less than 10%. And, uh, you know, when we first heard about it, you know, on, on one of these trips to the Valley back in 2013 about the uh, about Bitcoins, you know, it, it was something that I remember it was, you know, you couldn't really sleep. It's so exciting that you want to get into it. Um, and we looked into that space in China 2013 and it made our first investment into uh, BTC China, which is the only, back then was the only and the largest exchange in China. Um, after that, if you really... Think about it, you know, the, the obvious area to invest with, with wallets, uh, and we made the investment, uh, early investment to a company called blockchain.info, which is right now the biggest wallet uh, company in the world, um, with over 5 million active users around the world. 
And we also did a, you know, ABTC, which is a media company, the largest media player um, in the space. Uh, we did PeerSafe, which is a um, blockchain-based uh, technology for a focus on security um, for the corporate. And we've done a number of those things uh, over time. Um, but you know, I, I, I would be frank. You know, we didn't expect the ICO market to take off this quickly. Uh, I think that um, it's less of the Bitcoin pricing; it's more the ICO market that kind of created this boom. And uh, you know, for sure, this is sort of a um, you know bubbleish kind of situation. That's I, mean, I think that's should be pretty certain. Uh, but at the same time, we're quite excited because now uh, you know the mass venture market, the entrepreneurial market, is looking at blockchain as a fundamental technology to enable their um, you know infrastructure build out or their application build out. So, uh, so we really look at the intersection of real businesses and uh, and using blockchain. Uh, I think that so far most of the ICOs, I would say, majority of them are, are businesses that haven't done really well in the traditional sense. Uh, and they raise money. Um, with token sales, uh, with a promise of something, but uh, most of them have not demonstrated a sustainable business. But I think going forward next year or two, there will be more, you know, perhaps businesses that have been um, demonstrating um, sustainable growth in, in business models, leveraging tokens, and I think that's where where uh, it can be even more exciting. Yeah, a follow-up question on that. Um, as you had mentioned, some of the blockchain company, and then if they issue a token or they have a token round, what is your perspective? Um, are you pushing your portfolio into a token round or you are supportive when they, are you gonna put um, like crypto money into when they raise the next token round? What's your perspective on that? I mean, my quick answer is it really depends. I mean, I think certain companies actually is better to, um, you know, at least do the ICOs later. Uh, you may be able to use tokens first, but no sense of pushing to the mass market and you know, create certain yeah. hype around it. So, um, so timing is important uh, too. Not every business needs a token or blockchain, right? So I think um, you know uh, business where there's strong interaction with consumers, strong community effects, um, perhaps closed loop environments where a token can be used as a utility for some sort of value within that community. Those are um, perhaps the first area where we we'll explore. Um, but uh, we're, we're not, you know, in general, we're not pushing all CEOs to do it. I think a lot of our CEOs are uh, the ones that have been really, you know, operating scalable businesses, real businesses in some ways. Um, I think a lot of them are still in the learning phase over the last six months. So, um, you know, uh, we'll see how they how they kind of navigate the next couple of years. So let me a quick uh, follow on on that. Um, I, about uh, maybe six weeks ago, I had a visitor from China, high level executive telling me, hey, you have done so many investments, over 150, although you have three unicorns in your portfolio, but hey, this is the opportunity, you should, uh, you shouldn't sleep, you should uh, ask your companies to go and just uh, batch process and let them go and see her. Okay, so I think that was a great, great tip. Um, but uh, uh, seriously, um, I did review all our portfolios, about 150 of them, really quite a few are really good match. Um, I really believe the token economy, uh, many of speakers already mentioned, uh, but it is a natural fit. It's not definitely not a fit for all, everyone, but for, for many, uh, like multiple party uh, audience, uh, uh, you know, fans, that kind of com uh, company, it's good a fit. But the difficulty uh, usually is, uh, uh, you know, how to design a native, right? Instead of just go and try to raise some money, but you have to, look at it in long-term sustainable way. So we do encourage a lot of companies to do that. But it's not easy. When you have a company called Gai Zhaoxin, it's difficult. It's, you have an existing business you have put into it, it's not easy. But it's um, because the time window shifts, all that, so, uh, you know, it's, you know, three months ago, it definitely should go out quick. So there's, a, there's a, some tiny window. Uh, if you can raise the money, coming back to fix things, that become a new model. Right? It's all the ICOs. Is, is all set in the future, about setting a future, and then people buy, it, and then you have the resources to build it. But a lot of people cheated and scammed, you know, took the money and go, go away. But it really it should encourage people, uh, uh, you know, sell their dream and get the resource and build, build it, right? Like, otherwise, you cannot make your dream, uh, uh, you know, realize. So I, that's my take, you know, encourage 
the company would give natural fit with this type of uh, oh, uh, token economy and yeah. try to do this. Um, of course, things are changing, so you have to adapt to the current environment. Yeah, but still, that, that's I'm positive on this. Um, I can share some of, some of our perspective. Uh, even though in Q3 and Q4, we as exchange, we also invest more than 10 ICOs. We also try to uh, launch some tokens in our exchange, but uh, end of the day, we only choose very few tokens. Uh, why? Because uh, we believe, even in the high time, we believe most of the token, the price, the valuation, does not support its own valuation. Even though right now it's, we call community economics. We have token who are supported by a big community. But we see that most community members, most of them are we call newbies, or in Chinese called Xiaobai. They have no idea of what token it is. They have no idea how to sell the token. At the end of the day, you know, they become, they lost the money. They become, we call Jiu Cai, right? So, um, if you, uh, even though we call community economics, even though you call there are lots of supporters, but in the end, still, the, uh, big VCs or some of the investors right here, they have big punch of uh, the stakes and they sell it in the price drop. And most of the newbies, they lose money. So nobody will get into the circle and the price will not, get, will not jump anymore. So that's, that's the, I think, one of the biggest issues in current economy. Then that issue can be solved by the fundamental technical development and the continuously community building activities, right? So, and question for Henry as a crypto firm, what is your thought on, so in speaking of trading, do you have your thesis in trading? Because most of the crypto, uh, crypto firm that I work with, they all have an um, in-team in trading arm to maximize their, uh, the gain of the uh, crypto assets that they've been investing, right? So, what is your strategy? Um, I'm sorry, I still, I still don't have the trading arm right now. But, um, but I want to tell something about the uh, equity fund and the crypto fund the difference. And uh, I heard that uh, you will sign the most uh, common is that uh, to get ICOs, uh, uh, but uh, uh, yesterday it's a uh, uh, actually, companies. Well, uh, uh, as well as I say that uh, the uh, the token fund and the equity fund, and I think is indispensable parts of the uh, outstanding crypto. That I mean that uh, I'm, uh, as I know that so most uh, uh, several uh, several equity fund has. Uh, funding fund to running fundraising to set up a crypto fund. Uh, on the other side, we, we, we already raised an a equity fund of US dollars. Uh, I think, uh, I, I think there's a chain that the, um, uh, the chain behind, behind this is I think it's very simple because neither the equity fund and the uh, crypto fund is not perfect. Uh, it's, it's perfect. I think uh, uh, because uh, you can find it as a manner uh, of acquiring, acquiring uh, with uh, many years of development, and uh, it uh, assure um, it assure the investors' interest and the uh, uh, startups' passions, but uh, it has obviously the weakness, the low liquidity. Yeah. So uh, I think. Um, uh, 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 for, uh, uh, I remember that the, the lockup period from uh, three to five years or ten years that is too long to uh, for LP to wait. But uh, uh, what token uh, token found uh, uh, to raise uh, uh, mainstream token? Uh, what is uh, not only to solve the, the tradable 
I'll make it short, but, but also to solve the low uh, liquidity problem. Yeah. But uh, I, I think the point is that the, the, for now, the companies or not the, uh, the startups or the companies, but what, uh, no matter what the uh, equipment company or the crypto company, they all, the problem, uh, I think the problem is that um, some uh, excellent startups don't have, uh, are not going at uh, by managing the secondary market. So I think uh, too early to get SEOs or get tokens are now the uh, to high risk for them. Yeah, but uh, uh, if you, if you, uh, if the quality of the, uh, you have a special quality of the companies that means you, you have uh, massive users. And I think uh, it, uh, it may be a better way to issue tokens. But uh, I think the last thing I want to say is the, uh, the, uh, the crypto, all the uh, equipped uh, fund, all the company, uh, I think they will exist together in the future. Not all the ISO companies, all the uh, equipped companies. I think it's only the manner what they use to get money out of uh, so, uh, I mean, quickly, uh, add a few, a few points. Uh, I think not on the trading side, but really look at the investment side. The really token economy, I think, uh, uh, back to the last pen, also tied to the uh, future asset back the tokens. I clearly see the token got me excited. Is, uh, for example, a venture fund has a very long uh, illiquid period. I think uh, with token economy, clearly the, uh, the world is moving in that direction. So instead of just looking at trading for short, short term and leave, that which will be left for professional uh, traders, right, to to uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, you know make a business out of this asset class. But we are more uh, looking at uh, the future of uh, potentially this is the company we invest maybe have a new vehicle to achieve early liquidity. Uh, this is for sure a benefit to all the community or the investor community communities. So that that's and we look at the long term, it will be a feature. Uh, someday you invest a lot of uh, a lot of investors uh, to speculate, which is not necessarily a bad word. Uh, and and then the, for early backers to generate partial liquidity, if they choose to invest long term, they can do so. But today that is not possible. So that is a lot of pos positive things can happen in this kind of uh, as a class. Um, in, in point of trading, trading arm, uh, I don't think that's the right way for a VC or token fund to have a trading arm. Even though I know lots of people in this industry, they only, including you guys, have a trading arm. Because uh, it's really professional and also the volatility is so high. I think uh, even the traditional, as uh, some of some of traditional security professionals, they get into the industry, they can do it well. So I think still, uh, even though quantitative trading, that's uh, that's very good in the traditional security industry, but uh, uh, even though also lots of people think right here. In the token industry, the blockchain industry, the uh, quantitative or trading arm that's also provide liquidity, uh, liquidity. But still, from our perspective, we try to do it. We and also almost uh, virtually all the exchanges try to use their APIs to manipulate the price by the trading, their own trading arms. I think virtually all the uh, exchanges are doing so. Uh, but still, end of the day, they could do it well. Uh, I think uh, the, the key issue right here still, one is the value uh, of the company itself, two, the liquidity. Liquidity is uh, produced not by investors, I think, by the people, by the community, as you mentioned, as you said just now, you have to keep increasing your community, keep increasing the number of people who can support you. 
But even though you have the, lots of people support you, they still don't know how to trade. They don't, they don't know how to buy or how to sell. If they lose money, they couldn't. Your price will drop and the valuation will go down. I think that's one of the key issues. Uh, they, they don't know how to trade right here. They don't know, they don't know how to do it. The newbies, new users, the community members how, don't understand how to make money out of it. Okay, um, okay, uh, uh, yes, uh, 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 you, we don't have the training up, but uh, we already uh, think about this problem that uh, if you, uh, why we trade? Why we trade? We, if we invest a uh, item, a project, so why we trade? Uh, that may be the other that uh, we want to get more profit, right? But uh, if we want to get more profit, I think now exchange is a uh, is the best choice. Now the trading arm, you, you just open uh, it's cheaper. You can get the uh, best uh, profit. So uh, I I would like to say that the uh, if you invest the asset, a uh, vehicle asset uh, of a project, that means you know the value of this project, and uh, you also know when you buy and uh, when you sell. So even though the the, the price job. Uh, too much on the center market, but you believe that it's, it, it, will, it will raise. So, in my opinion, that's, uh, you want to go for the FI, you ask the uh, item that uh, we believe, that means uh, we will take it for um, many years. Yeah, in hell, it will build an ecosystem of anything that's too bigger. Yeah, the, the, but there's also some black swan events, like let's say if the core technology of this team they outsource to the other ones um, to develop it on behalf of them, which means they're not developing the fundamental technology. And then at that time, if you hold let's say five percent of the coin, how do you do? You still gonna like what is your strategy to uh, facing this issue? When your portfolio, if you are a long-only blockchain fund, crypto fund, do you still gonna be supportive for them, or what is the strategy? Okay, so I think that's just the uh, new phenomenon uh, in the past. From my perspective, it means that you don't have such an uh, opportunity often. You, you are dealing with, luckily, when a company went public, then you have a portfolio company, for example, or whatever that. Unicorns they go public and then you have uh, uh, the shares in the uh, company which are liquid. In many cases they are not. So I think that's the same strategy. I think that for many established VC funds we need to have a strategy to say, hey, uh, you know, also like all the tax issues, but but you have to say, hey, how do I do I hold it? You know, do I sell it? Do I sell half? It's kind of similar. Similar uh, thing, but just uh, usually or in the past, it's always uh, considered a bigger milestone has been achieved. So the the mission for a VC fund, you know, kind of accomplished when it go public, right? So not not many people talk about, uh, you know, how what's the strategy going forward. Although it's really good for pure financial strategy, the investment period coming from public, maybe you are out of the board, or maybe you are, uh, you know. So that kind of thing. So, but really in the crypto space, it's really new. The company going ICO, they are maybe many of them has yet to deliver a product. So that is interesting. I haven't thought about your question. How do you should, should the support it, help the company? I think. But with, uh, with so many token holders, I mean, it's really not a. I think it definitely the investors' role will, will decrease a lot. Maybe one tenth. Everything. From uh, the numbers I have seen, right, so it's that if you are you own one co company ten percent in the token economy, at the best you own one percent, one tenth, right? That's the way people see it. You hope the company can tokenize to generate ten x the acceleration, right? That's the for example the previous thing we talk about why the company need a tokenize, right? Okay, so you are aiming for I need a. I need to give more ben benefits to my community instead of have Facebook or the, a lot of monopoly company reap all the benefits. I want to have these benefits give it to more for my community. That's how the economics works. I think it's 
not like a, suddenly, uh, you know, just everybody uh, can make a quick money. So, um, so I think uh, that is a new thing evolving, uh, running a new community supporting the investors' role. Uh, I think, uh, I think it kind of uh, reduced, and then also the, um, maybe the VC industry itself will go through. We go through a lot of fundamental change. I clearly see the thing to ask, oh, the VC, are they really kind of a, without them, nothing will work? Or maybe the world will move into a more crowdfunding way that is the play only uh, selective, the team selection and help, and then the rest, their, their role will reduce. At least, in my view, it will reduce a lot. So it's not like the company do or die 100% depend on the investor anymore. I think uh, that's my view. Uh, I, in fact, I kind of uh, agree with Hong that uh, the Particularly, he said the chicken coat. Uh, I think it's related to your issue with the company and outsource their technology to some experienced persons, experienced teams. I mean, chicken coat itself, it doesn't matter at all. Technology itself, of course, it's very important, but in the decentralized token economy, token blockchain industry, I think the, the most important is still the how, decent, how decentralized your token, your shareholder, your, not shareholder, your token holders. End of the day, it's still community. I think it's still how many support you have. I think, and from our perspective, we care about liquidity. And liquidity is, uh, has been produced by investors, but most of them not from investors. Liquidity are from the users, are from the common people, are from the newbies. So that's why we saw the problem, and that's why we are trying to solve this problem by providing, by releasing a, a second generation exchange, particularly for newbies. They don't want so many, they don't need so many QSAs, they don't need to uh, understand so many metrics, they don't need to understand the code itself uh, it, it, at all. They only want to know what's the lowest price right now. They will only want to create uh, like one tab to create a wallet and one tab to buy or sell their assets. They, they want to also want to know some simple strategies to uh, manage their assets, the crypto assets. I think that's what we are doing. We, we, we are, in fact, we are working with the best uh, best exchange technology provider in China, it's called Chain Up, and we joint venture to launch our product. End of uh, April, it's called uh, uh, Buy Up. B-I-Up, which means Buy Up. So that's for new bits, that's for everyone, including for our investors. Great, I think we come into a conclusion of this panel, either from traditional investors or from crypto firm, or from exchange sides, we all want to look into the fundamental of the te technical development of the company and also how they grow their community. And then we are basically very, very positive in this industry. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. On the last next panel, we have uh, Armin Ebrahimi. Crazy Casaretti and uh, Plain Wilkinson. And um, this panel will be moderated by Mr. Bill O'Connor. And um, uh, after, the, after the last panel, we will be having a raffle session where we are going to select three winners to actually get tokens sponsored by Sportex. So to enter the raffle, please put your business card in the raffle jar over there. Our staff will walk around this venue. So if you haven't put your business card when you check in, feel free to do so. And we will be having the raffle after the last panel. And welcome to the first
continue to send your questions up upstage. Okay, you guys ready? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm from New York, so I talk loud and fast. So <laughs> feel free to make an obscene gesture if I do either of those too much, okay? Um, Bill O'Connor, um, really excited to be here. I'm an innovation consultant and strategist in San Francisco. Um, I was the innovation strategist at Autodesk, a big tech company in San Francisco for about seven years. Um, what a great topic, the development of blockchain technology. Um, I'm here not just also as a moderator, getting the great insights out of these guys. I'm also here to learn. I'm on the board of an um, uh, interesting blockchain-related company called Utopian. And also uh, the founder of another big data company, and it occurred to me only in the last three months that uh oh, the blockchain ramifications for our offering. So I'm here to learn as much as these guys are. I'm here to learn uh, from you guys. I'm excited about that. So um, you know, technology revolutions we do them pretty well in Silicon Valley. Um, I think at the beginning of any kind of a sort of a revolution like this, it's important to also look at the challenges, the limitations, the roadblocks, the things that are going to be super annoying two years from now. Uh, the problems, et cetera, et cetera. And so my goal as a moderator for the next 28 minutes is to get as many good insights and advice and next practices from you guys out to the crowd. Does that make sense? Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. Is anybody out there? Clap if you're out there. You ready? Everyone. I'm still out there. So I'm going to let, um, whenever I'm introduced, I, it, I'm, my bio is always kind of butchered for some reason, so I'm going to let these fine folks give you a, a quick introduction uh, about each of them. One, two, three, and then we'll dive into the topics. Uh, my name is Brittany Casaretti. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called True Story, and we're basically building a truth layer for the blockchain where we validate information in a decentralized way and make it accessible to the blockchain. Um, and uh, my background, I was previously at Goldman Sachs, and then I was a partner at Andrews and Horowitz, and then um, most recently I was an engineer at Coinbase. And recent Horowitz, I'm not familiar, could you? Know? <laughs> I'll be adding bad jokes once every four or five. Uh, My name is Armin Ebrahimi, I'm the founder and CEO of Shohard. Uh, I've been in the tech industry for about 30 years, and some of the highlights are just my uh, background. I've had two companies, one that I exited and sold to HP, and another one uh, more recently that I actually sold to AOL. I also spent 10 years at Yahoo uh, as the head of platform engineering. Uh, three years ago, we started Showcard, and the concept behind Showcard is creating a digital identity that uh, belongs to the user, the data being on their own devices, with private keys and so forth that they actually own, that they can decide who to share that with, and having the validation codes that verifies that uh, through uh, certifications and signatures on the blockchain. Uh, and that would be able to have a unified identification and control of the user as to how they share that and how they access the services. Thank you. My name is Gokhay Mokasana, the co-founder and CEO of a crypto project called New Cypher. Uh, we are basically a privacy layer for public blockchain and decentralized applications. We give developers a way to store, share, and manage uh, private data on public cloud systems like IPFS or Swarm. Uh, we're fortunate to be backed by crypto funds like Polychain, FPG, and Y Combinator. Uh, my background personally is from a blend of software engineering as well as traditional finance. I uh, worked at Morgan Stanley for a couple of years covering tech in the uh, telcos on the M&A side. I uh, decided I would rather do stuff in blockchain space and build actual technology or products as opposed to financial models. So we came out here uh, about four years ago now and started working in, in blockchain. Okay, great. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you guys for coming out. Okay, so let's, my questions are in sort of increasing order of complexity. Okay, let's start with some of the basics, right? Um, security and privacy, right? So, so, you know, to some degree, part of the excitement is about the, uh, some of the inherent na the nature of it is, is hard to hack to some degree, you know, about that. Um, and yet, um, you think about all the different types of data that are going to be interfacing with blockchain, um, security is obviously a, a, a concern for people, both experts and not. So I want to throw it out to the floor um, to talk about security and privacy, with also the caveat that technology is always an arms race. I mean, I, I've been immersing myself in this, and it's like, wait a minute, you know, as much as it's secure now, other people are trying to make it unsecure. So we've got both those things, privacy and security sort of in general, and also the nature of keeping it safe as it incorporates all this data and, 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 and the ongoing arms race. So. Who wants to dive in? I guess this has kind of been in my wheelhouse. Uh, I would sort of break it down 
to two different areas. One would be like transaction privacy, which is obviously the focus of uh, privacy coins like Monero, Dash, Zcash, uh, Google Wibble. There's a lot of different approaches. Um, and then also like data privacy, so people actually building decentralized applications, how they manage potentially private or sensitive data. Um, I'd say that the, the former is obviously much more mature. Um, you know, we have multiple live privacy coins that are being used in production today. Um, you know, obviously, we're looking at putting ZK Snarks into Ethereum itself. Um, where I spend most of my time is obviously on the latter, so helping give developers a way to actually store and manage private data. So this could be health records, you know, customer names, addresses, these sorts of things inside of a decentralized application. Um, our approach is, is one of probably several kind of emerging approaches. Uh, we use a technology called proxy re-encryption. Other popular approaches would be things like uh, multi-party computation or homomorphic encryption, kind of like the three big buckets. Um, but we're sort of all trying to solve this fundamental problem of you know, enabling this new wave of various sort of futuristic decentralized applications. So projects that are looking to store, let's say, medical records on IPFS, they need some way to have those records obviously be private, confidential, and encrypted, but still have those encrypted records uh, be shareable with, say, a doctor or a hospital um, or some valid recipient. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting work being done uh, on, on that side as well. Okay, great. Um, you, your question was a great one, and you know, the whole question about it being an arms race, I think blockchain is still rather new. And there are only a limited number of Google Live applications that are on the blockchain. So therefore, um, y y there's going to be time before hackers start getting in. They're going after cryptocurrencies, yeah. hackers are, because that's where the real applications are, at least large scale applications. So I think we'll see more of that, obviously, as time goes on, the arm race will be. Uh, one of the things that's important to acknowledge about blockchains is that it's an infrastructure that's got uh, it, it, an architecture that allows you to have security, that allows you to have a better, uh, you know, privacy. But you still have to architect something on top of it that takes care of that. You could, you know, you start hashing actual data if you have, you know, start putting real data on the blockchain. There's nothing about the blockchain that would inherently pre prevent you from doing that, and that's accessible for, uh, from anywhere. People could actually look at uh, data that you cannot uh, delete is immutable. So you have to be conscious of those things. One of the approaches we've taken is in terms of what we put on the blockchain uh, is that we use it for verification purposes only. The data is in different storage. It's still encrypted, typically with users or service providers. And we only put um, basically digital signatures of hashes of data and hashes that are one-way hashes. You can't reverse engineer it back. Uh, in general, we caution around putting encrypted data on an immutable ledger. Uh, because if you have that, you have to lose the keys. Uh, or the keys are compromised, but then the data is available for everyone to look at. So I think it comes down to you still got to architect the solution. There's no magic of, oh, I use blockchain, boom, I'm secure. That's a good, good thing to know. What's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, it, it's an interesting issue, right? Like, we want privacy, but we want decentralization. I mean, you want decentralization, you have to kind of open up the ledger to everyone so that it's much more visible and validatable. And so I think if we're trying to move to a decentralized and private blockchain, it's, it's a lot of engineering fundamentally. And like that's why centralized systems work so well, because they can maintain all these properties that we care about, privacy, convenience, security. But as soon as you decentralize, you make trade-offs. So it's interesting watching this space, and I think in terms of privacy, I'm seeing a lot happening in layer two, where people are using, either just storing a lot less on the blockchain and doing a lot more in layer two. Um, that way, you only use the blockchain for settlement and kind of like the stuff that you want preserved over the long run, which I think is how we should think about the blockchain anyway, because the blockchain is like this immutable record, and that's kind of like the holy grail. But there's a lot you can do to use this blockchain as a fundamental layer, but still do stuff in the layer on top and have some of the features that you care about, like privacy. And then address that, like, okay, immutable sounds good at one level, yeah. also terrifying at a different level. How do you address that idea? I mean, if, it is, if there's an element of permanent or immutable, how do you sync that up with privacy concerns? I think she actually nailed it in terms of you got to be careful what you put and where you put it. So I think the immutability has a lot of value in terms of security, authentication, the trust you can create with that. 
I mean, someone can't just go in and mark with that change and somehow. But you have to be careful when you put in an immutable record because and a public ledger because everyone can see it. So the trade-off is actually in the architecture of what you build. You're not going to put everything. Your, your only source of data cannot be a blockchain and have secure, you know, sensitive data uh, on the blockchain that everyone can go in and, and eventually see. So you got to architect it right. The immutability is actually an incredible asset. Our product uses it, and I think without it, it would make it very difficult for us to do that. Uh, but you, you, you got to keep, you got to decide what things you keep off and what things you keep on the blockchain. Yeah. I think you hit on a very sort of interesting tension there between this idea of immutability and then not only from a technical perspective, but also from a public policy perspective. In Europe, we have GDPR and the right to be forgotten, which you know, put something on the blockchain, can't forget it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds and you know, whether regulators are kind of forced to reevaluate their approach or you know, if they decide that they're going to crack down on companies that are putting things onto immutable ledgers that by law, need to be replicable in some way. Um, but I, I, I agree with uh, the point you just made that you, know, you should be, particularly if it's bulk data, you should be putting a lot of data on the blockchain anyway because it's not a particularly good data store. That's why we have things like IPFS or Swarm or, or these, these high level file systems. Okay, that's a good distinction. All right, let's move to scalability. And I, I love this one because it's like a Zen koan in a way. It's like, okay, proof of work and it's purposefully slow and all this stuff. By the way, I'm stealing shamelessly from an article that you wrote on Medium, so thank you for that, um, among other things, right? If I found it much clearer than a lot of other articles on things. So scalability, the idea that, I mean, the beauty of this is that there are inherent safeguards broken on the timing, using time as a, as a safeguard. How then do you scale, uh, given that that's, those are some of the inherent features? Uh, Maybe I'll start off with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, fundamentally, the, just to go take a step back, like the reason blockchain is going to scale is because it's not it's not a distributed database, but it's a replicated database. So everyone's maintaining a copy, and everyone has to update it at the same time and validate it at the same time, and so that's why it slows it down. Um, now, that, the reason we do that again is because we want to decentralize this thing and not. Um, not have it centralized. And so if we're, if we're making that trade-off, then like there's various things we can do to reach scalability. And I kind of talked about it in that article, like one way is, one, one way that's already kind of already in terms of production is like state channels. So state channels is again layer two. And like I think, again, it, it, you know, it, the answer keeps coming back to layer two. It's like we can't do everything on the blockchain, guys. Let's go above a layer. And like layer two, state channels are basically you open a, a channel and you do a lot of microtransactions and you only go to the blockchain and you just settle the fi final amount amongst the two people. And so that's one idea of scale, one way to do scalability. So instead of hitting the blockchain for every transaction, you do it in another private channel and then hit, the, hit it at the end. Um, another way to scale blockchains is, is by uh, what's called sharding. In a traditional database world, sharding is when you distribute the load across multiple different servers. So now we're going back to like a traditional architecture. Let's figure out how to shard this and still make it secure. And this is a really, really hard thing to do. Um, uh, other approach, I mean, I, I don't know, like, do you want to talk about other approaches? Sure, I think the, the concepts you talked about are absolutely correct. I think uh, some of the blockchains that we've had, uh, the, the most popular ones, Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, uh, you will like, set the transactions a second theoretically, realistically being around three or four, and Ethereum being around 20 and realistically lower than that. The other part of it is the fees of transactions. Two years ago, when we first did our, uh, had the first production version of our product, it would cost like two to three cents on Bitcoin to write a transaction and about 10 minutes to get a confirmation. Now it could range anywhere from you know, five to eight dollars all the way up to 28, 30 dollars. And the transactions we do cost less than that. You know, the revenue we get on those things is significantly less, so it just makes it unfeasible to go that route. So ultimately, and then the other problem is that these are, uh, you know, the blockchain itself is a database. It's got a load on one machine. All these different transactions from various points, uh, places are on there. It's not practical to put too much data on it, and on Bitcoin, you be limited to the number of characters you can put on. Um, if there you got more room, but even that is limited. So ultimately, you got to have, you know, uh, the second layer, if you're talking about it, ultimately we use side chains where we do transactions on that. We do what's called box farming, where it, it, it's similar in, in concept, 
but we get multiple, multiple transactions with boxcar and either by time or number of transactions create a hash that we proof to work on the public blockchain. What's nice about the more popular public blockchains is that um, you can establish a greater trust with those. Rather than saying, well, I'll tell you what, they've got a high scale, private side chain, or whatever form blockchain that I have, can you trust me on it? So we do, you can use the public blockchains, you just get just smart as to how you utilize that. And it goes back into, if you look at a lot of blockchain projects, there are very few vertical in nature. They will not, um, you, you know, at best they've done a POC, very small scale things. And they haven't really delved into the architectural issues of it. It goes back to the first question. You've got the blockchain, you've got this asset, but you still got an architecture solution for it, and there are other providers that will act, you know, we're building our own, but I think over time we'll have other providers actually will provide different infrastructure to support. And I think that's part of what you do is the ecosystem will build up. We built parts of it, but I, but I would also still warn, we, you can't just expect that, you know what, the problem's going to solve itself. Yeah. Um, if you look back in the uh, late 90s, there were providers that would say, you know, we'll, we'll provide high graphics on our web page, it's right, and, and some video content and so on. But there was no bandwidth to allow it to run. And I remember uh, many websites who would say, it'll come, and it eventually came. But by the time it came, they were no longer in business, because they didn't survive it. You look at, like what we were doing at Yahoo was very little graphics using simpler pages, just so that they could load faster and get the content out. So I think you have to be adaptable to the changes of the industry as you build your applications to deal with things like this. Well. But there will be more solutions that will come. Yep. But even today, you could do high-scale transactions using the blockchain. You just got to architect that. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, mean, I think they covered a lot of it. Um, you know, also we're seeing a lot of projects that are. You know, and then you've got the you know, you know, a lot of companies that are building uh, vertical huh? solutions or horizontal solutions. But a particular area, they're saying we're solving this. We're using blockchain-based solutions to do it as well. And there's not enough infrastructure in place yet, so I think that's where a lot of those people implementing those various solutions still have to be logged on. We've developed a lot of those ourselves. Uh, just the tool set has not been available. Uh, I think you, you still have to do that because part of the thing we're still uh, challenged with is being able to get blockchain solutions out there beyond POCs and pilots. Yeah, you, you know, even with us, we have far more many POCs and pilots than we do live customers. And we've got live customers, but they're, uh, you know, far fewer than if it was a different kind of a company. And that's just part of the blockchain adoption yep. path. So if you are just waiting for the infrastructure to be built up, again, you could go back to the same example again. You could be out of business before you have the infrastructure to be able to well, probably the problem. Well, my businesses were built by people who were annoyed that the thing wasn't there. Oh, no, absolutely. They it. Absolutely. They want to solve their own problems, and you know, they annoy people at the office exactly. out of pocket money. That's right. Yes. right. So I think that's part of what we'll see in the evolution, yeah. is that people are solving their own real problems, and the closer they are to solving real applications and real problems, the better uh, set of solutions that they'll actually develop in that process. And I think we'll see those then spinning off as things that other people will end up using, either by seeing it as a blueprint of what to build, or sometimes we'll spinning out as a uh, set of solutions that go out. Let me jump to the next topic of access. This is fascinating to me because I love the media. Every article you read now, blockchain is going to change every single industry on Earth. In fact, it's already doing it. And when you get Stephen Colbert and Bill Maher joking about it, you know it's big, right? Um, but I want to talk about access. What's fascinating, blockchain, you know, medical records, financial, military, government, personal, blah, 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 blah. So I'm curious myself, how, what, I want to say, how on Earth do we bridge the gap between you know, blockchain per se and then, you know, if you just go health, financial, military, like how do we, uh, how does it bridge out to all of the industries that's reportedly going to change? I mean, that's a good problem to have. But you got a universal impact, but how do you bridge those, how do you bridge to those specific types of information? In, in 30 seconds or less, go. When you say bridge, I guess I'm, can you explain what you're, what you're, what you're I, I don't even know if I mean that. I mean, I mean yeah. as, as blockchain, that's what we're seeing in the world, right? Yeah. As blockchain, it's more totally right. how is it going to, I'll change my metaphor, how is it going to digest all these different types of data? Yeah, so I think it's, I think of it less of like, let's apply blockchain to this, because I think, and I think of it more of like, do you have a problem and does blockchain help solve that problem better? And in some industries it will, it will be astronomically yes, and in some industries it will be probably no. 
And I think that's how you should think about it. Like someone walked up to me today, not to like shame that person, but he was like, I want to solve this using blockchain. And it was just like, all right, does it need to be solved using blockchain? Why do you think a blockchain is better, et cetera? So I think these industries that want to blockchainify their things, I think some of it, some of them will need more of it than others. Like, and some of it will be in that class. What if blockchain was like a household cleaner, like metal yeah. or something that will get 99% of germs? Yeah, this seems to happen with every technology. Like even with AI, two or three years ago, everyone would be like, yeah, this was AI, AI with this, this was AI, and then like, now that kind of disappeared. I think the same thing will happen with blockchain. Back in the day, the web, it was the same thing. And blockchain will be almost be like a enabling feature. Yeah. I think just to kind of uh, second what you said, and I'll add on a bit to that, is blockchain is not, it, blockchain is an infrastructure, it's not a solution. And that's, a, that's an important distinction to make there. Uh, there you know, over the past year, especially since 2017, with classic cryptocurrencies and ICOs, there's been a lot more attention to the blockchains. And people understand it a lot more, and that's what we get a lot more customers is help, you know, with the blockchain solution. And they don't really understand it well, they just feel like something's going to happen there, and we get to do something using blockchain. We tend to, um, and, and we learned this uh, a couple of years ago when we first got in the industry, is that we're an identity management uh, platform. Here's the specific things we allow. We do actually help out with regards to better control for access to data, yeah. uh, being able to lower fraud, making it easier for users to uh, access things, making it more secure. That's what our value uh, proposition is. But uh, the challenge is that uh, you can't do that using traditional systems, so we explain to use the blockchain to do that. And we've had people who say, oh, do we have to have miners? Like, I've had banks that say, so we need to hire our own miners. It's like, no, you don't really need to worry about the blockchain in many ways. You need to understand it. Yeah. But the thing is, you got it away from a lot of that. You need to really focus on what the solutions are. I think there are a lot of solutions in terms of access that we're talking about in healthcare, in, in finance, in travel, a bunch of different verticals. They're not all going to happen together. You're going to have those early adopters. Some are pushed because of the vertical they're in. I think in finance, there's a greater push, acceptance, and understanding of it. I think healthcare is a little bit slower in the process, but they will come along. But those early adopters and their successes will actually pave the way for others. And I think the solutions that get, get out there, and I think to your point earlier, is it's not that uh, magic blockchain square that solves 99% of the problem, yeah, right. but it's the solutions that focus on solving your real problem, and they're enhanced by using blockchain. Very good. And this is maybe a little bit of a cop out. When I put on my engineering hat, it's a lot easier to look at the landscape and sort of identify where the infrastructure gaps are than it is to sort of try to figure out what the end user facing the apps that are going to be most successful, most compelling are. And I think this is there's a tendency when there's sort of a new computing environment to just sort of take stuff from let's say you know, a web app, the web app world, and sort of graft it onto a blockchain, but you know with a token. Um, and I don't think. In most cases, that's not particularly interesting. It takes a while for sort of the new industry to kind of figure out what are the most compelling sort of native use cases. It's the same when the smart smartphones came around. It took a while for people to figure out that it made a lot of sense just to be able to pull your phone out uh, and call a taxi or call an Uber on the side of the road, which you know, obviously didn't make sense to have Uber sort of on your desktop. Um, so I think to some degree, hopefully, that'll end up being the case uh, with blockchain. Because if it's not, then we're all sort of out of luck. Uh, we see a little bit of it, I think, with like. Uh, digital scarcity is so, like some people might say there's trivial applications, but things like CryptoKitties or things are somehow making uh, digital assets scarce, like collectibles and things like that. Okay. All right, we have three minutes to go. I know this is this is the lightning round. Okay. I, this is one thing I'm really fascinated with. Like, I think that this time in human history, probably it's the most disruptive emerging technologies aligned together that I've ever seen. Certainly more than the web, for example. So I'm going to throw three disruptive emerging technologies at you. And I would phrase it this way, and answer whichever is most interesting in the two and a half minutes we have to go. How is it, how is blockchain going to affect the IoT, Internet of Things, and or how is it going to interact with AI? And something else I'm fascinated with is how is quantum down the line? <laughs> you know, in nine seconds or less. So, you know, pick any of the three, IoT, AI, or quantum, what you see, what's the most interesting thing that you could see happening moving forward? Anyone dive in? I mean, the most crazy futuristic thing, I guess, would be AI-controlled DAO. So, yeah. a decentralized organization that's 
fully controlled and run by an AI. Yeah. Um, is able to sort of earn money and sustain itself. You can hire and fire people and entities and autonomous organizations. Yep, or even just contracting with other AIs that are on their down. Yeah. And then we just kick back. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would, and I say this first partly based on the experiences that I've had and folks we work with, but I think IoT is one of those areas that is still in its infancy and is going to uh, incredibly grow. Uh, managing and controlling those devices uh, that are not human beings, in fact, uh, is one of those things that requires a different infrastructure in place. And uh, you know, we've been working with IoT providers where I think blockchain-based solutions can actually be fundamentally uh, critical to their operations, especially when you're dealing with the mass number of devices and the different people or services that actually interact with them. I think we'll see a lot in that. That's a good point. And what's your, pick your technology. What do you, you get the last word? Um, I think I'm, I'm in the same boat with IoT. I think distributed, like, because now you have all these devices that are distributed across the world with IoT, um, you can also think of them as basically computing devices that add more compute power to the blockchain. So I think that's a very interesting way to think about IoT. I think like that was one of the original founding visions of 21 Co, but they never really pulled it off, where they were trying to use cell phone devices as blockchain mining equipment. So I think if you can pull that off with IoT, I would be fascinated by it. That's cool. We don't have time for me to reference Pi Piper from Silicon Valley and <laughs> the distributed internet. I just did that, or whatever. Okay, I think we have four minutes to go. Thank you. Um, I think we have some questions. Do we have questions? What's that? Have to move on because we're running out of time. Well, the crowd has no questions. Yeah, everything is solved, right? Let's <laughs> yeah. give the panelists a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great time. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, I encourage you to talk to the speakers in person when they get off stage. Thank you for joining us. And the next panel will be focusing on the diversified blockchain applications, moderated by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Curious Wong from. Uh, China Mobile, and then joining the panels will panel will be James Eggleston, um, Srini Bassan, Sri Ram, and Miss Tony Shi. Welcome. And this will be the last panel of this afternoon session. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my honor to uh, moderate this panel with everyone, especially it's the last panel. So, uh, before uh, beginning, uh, so my name is Curious. I'm not sure about myself. My name is Curious. Senior Director, Head of uh, Business Development in Pharmacia Mobile. I'm also running the Chita Incubator Program uh, based in Palo Alto. So, uh, actually, in the past couple of months, I actually spent quite a lot of time in the spectrum area, especially. Uh, to be honest, well, this week is a disaster for myself because the Instagram and the Bitcoin, they probably just hit the lowest price in the market and they lost a lot of money out there. And then I still find an excuse to explain to my wife. But today is actually the highlight of my week because uh, I got uh, this chance to explore the bright future of the blockchain application with the expert here. Uh, so I would like to start the um, uh, introduction of each of you. So, Tony. Yeah, hello. My name is Tony Xu. I'm the CEO of uh, Super Game Chain and Narvelous. I believe we all live this world to experience. Uh, we all live this life to experience the world in with safety and to connect with trust and also to contribute with reward. I believe internet has enabled us to experience to connect and to contribute. And now, blockchain is here to help us build that safety, trust, and reward layer on top of the internet. That's why I'm here with uh, Super Game Chain. We would like to use blockchain to democratize the gaming ecosystem and to build this uh, um, safety, trust, and uh, reward system for all the game developers. We're, we're gonna bring uh, there's a uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, the SGCC will use this as a unified uh, cryptocurrency for the all gaming world. Okay. Thank you, Tony. 
Yeah. Great, I'm James Eggleston from PowerLedger. Um, PowerLedger forms the transactive layer in electricity markets, so anywhere that there is a poles and wires running down the street, um, our software can go into that market to make transactions much more efficient. What we do is tokenize kilowatt hours of electricity. The mission of PowerLedger is to democratize and decarbonize the electricity market. Uh, we held our ICO uh, last year, end of uh, Q4 2017, um, and what we do is really um, put the consumer at the heart of electricity markets and help them use the existing electricity infrastructure in a way that's never been done before um, that benefits um, them to put uh, generation behind the meter. Hello everybody, my name is Sri Ram with SkewChain. And at SkewChain, uh, we use the blockchain to bring efficiencies into the supply chain. Uh, the world of collaborative commerce is upon us. And by collaborative commerce, I mean that members of the supply chain ecosystem, from buyers to suppliers to the supplier, supplier to the growers of the original product or the raw materials, are all participating in the production of goods. And you and I, as consumers, participate in the consumption of those goods. Uh, the marketplace as we know it has evolved through the millennia based upon you know, each uh, decade's technologies that they evolved. The blockchain fundamentally shifts that paradigm. It allows for the first time in human history the opportunity for us as consumers to participate. The concept of inventory is changing and uh, we are excited about what it is that we are doing. Thank you. So in the past couple of months, I actually talked to a lot of blockchain I mean, application and there's a lot of stock company. And one of the common questions I understand from them is that why do you think this blockchain technology is key to your solution your, in your cases? And then why it is so important and what's the differentiation from those centralized platform uh, gens? Maybe you can add on that. Yeah. yeah, great. So um, the space we play in is the electricity utility space. And really, what blockchain does is it echoes a, a decentralization that's already occurring in the market. So within electricity markets, what we're seeing is a decentralization of generation assets, um, a decentralization of storage assets. And really what this software provides is the ability to decentralize uh, payment um, and ownership of units of electricity within that market. So we're not creating the wave, where we're really just riding it, and blockchain uh, seems to be the solution uh, that, that, that solves that issue. So from our perspective, we're not rewriting the laws of physics, um, we're just rewriting the rules of the market. And um, you know, in true, true nature of uh, the fact that innovation outpaces regulation, um, leading the cutting edge in this space. Right. So Sri Vasa, you case you're only the supply chain leverage in the supply chain technology, and what's your uh, you know, case there? So let me take a simple example. We walk into a grocery store and purchase some ice cream. That ice cream essentially came from milk powder. And that milk powder came from a cow's milk, and the cow ate corn feed, and the corn came from a grower that came from a seed. And imagine all the different steps that that goes through before you and I actually get to eat it. And think of all the transactions that took place, the purchase orders, the warehouse receipts, the ships that travel, uh, money, the letters of credit, uh, insurance, and you can begin to understand that just the act of eating ice cream essentially kicks off the whole supply chain. And what the blockchain allows us to do is to bring a significant amount of efficiency in there. And it is by its very nature decentralized. The grower of corn and the grower of milk are two different people. Tony? Yeah, I came from the gaming industry, and I believe there are a lot of uh, articles and a lot of cases that uh, that shows there's great enthusiasm in uh, combining blockchain and gaming, including the crypto kitties that was very popular last year. So, uh, and also, you know, blockchain uses a token system, which is not. Um, not stranger to the gaming industry. There were, there, as you know, like there being like a virtual currencies in gaming all the time. The question is, um, what do we want to use blockchain to solve? It's not about whether we're going to use it. So I believe in the gaming industry, there are a lot of issues that the current uh, gaming 
ecosystem cannot resolve, but now blockchain can resolve. For example, as a gaming developer, if you want to deliver your game to the end users, this is your need. You just want to build a game and let the users to play your game. But now you're facing a lot of uh, difficulties. First of all, you need to raise the fund, and then you need to go to the App Store, and the App Store will take 30% off. And also, like for example, in App, uh, in app Store, like um, uh, there are millions of uh, applications, three million applications and the games out there. So if you don't do advertisement, your game will never reach the hands of the gamers. So this is unsolvable in the current uh, ecosystem. But with blockchain and a super game chain, we are aiming to solve these issues by providing a fast and uh, uh, easy SDK solution of blockchain so that all the game developers and the game platforms can use this uh, blockchain solution. And they could use it to raise funds, to have the users, uh, to, to match with the users without having to spend a hefty um, user acquisition cost mm -hmm. and um, to let the users play their games. Right. I'm just out of curiosity because uh, many people they are leveraging blockchain, uh, so you know, try to replace the current central platform, whatever is insurance, data, gaming, power, or su supply chain. So we don't know the benefit of blockchain that is the you know security and transparency, but we don't know the problem of it because the efficiency. So from your point of view, I'm just just guess, right? In the, in the next two years. What field app could be widely adopted I mean, by the people or in the public and then become really popular or metric like Facebook social media network we are using? So, or in what case you think that blockchain technology is not an ideal case for them? I think any application that uh, will want to uh, democratize it or uh, make, make it, uh, you know, that is using data and uh, has a value associated with their system. And if they want to make it um, trustworthy and efficient, they should be using blockchain. However, as you said, there is a technology uh, bottleneck. Right. Like last year, uh, for, for example, CryptoKitties was using Ethereum uh, in their game. However, games are presenting a higher demand for the technology throughput. So, uh, uh, CryptoKitties was uh, almost brought the Ethereum down, kind of like that. And then, so it is up to the developers to to always understand, explore what technologies is the best for the industry. And um, it's, it's not about the weather; it's about the, you know what. So I would believe um, as long as we could provide them the best, like a blockchain solution. A lot, all of the game developers should be bringing their games to blockchain, and uh, maybe some other uh, like applications also should, as long as the technology can provide. James, have anything to add? Yeah, I certainly echo the idea that if there's a digital transmission of value, um, blockchain certainly has application. Uh, look, from my background in the utility space and the policy space, and um, although I participated in um, holding cryptocurrency myself since 2012, uh, I never thought that um, my work in energy policy and my hobby in cryptocurrency would come together. Uh, even when um, we were initially talking to some of our other co-founders about blockchain being the solution, although I was uh, quite cognizant in terms of what it was, I was, I was also sceptical about uh, whether or not it would solve the issue we were seeking to address um, in the electricity utility sector. Um, we, 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 did, we have looked at blockchain applications in other aspects of utilities, say water and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, creating a company uh, to provide a benefit to the market um, outside of being a utility, um, the, the being a, a private company and providing a blockchain solution in electricity um, certainly was the best uh, line of attack. Um, uh, there would be efficiencies in other utility sectors such as transport and water. Um, however, uh, I think market incumbents or utilities themselves are probably better placed because what they would be seeing is more of an internal efficiency in terms of value. Whereas um, in the electricity space, 
uh, you can incentivize users to generate uh, additional electricity behind the meter. So for instance, um, with solar PV. I, I know it's the end of the day, but um, can I ask you a show of hands? Um, who here is connected to electricity grid? I presume everyone's connected to electricity grid. Is anyone off grid by any chance? No one's off grid. Perfect. Um, can I also ask, does anyone here have solar PV on their rooftop? One. Or is there more? Can barely see. Oh, does anyone know anyone with solar PV? Just to, just to give me a sense on that. Yeah, wow. So, I mean, for instance, um, I, I come from a pretty sunny country. It's from Australia. Um, one, one in four people have solar PV. So um, basically, our, our ability to provide a, a digital infrastructure to handle high volumes of transactions and settle them in real time um, solves a significant problem in the market. Um, but yeah, it's quite interesting actually. Uh, the lack of decentralised <laughs> I, I know there's a lot more. Maybe this room's a bad sample. Thank you. Sure. From a consumer perspective, uh, if you can sort of think of the barcode that you pick up uh, in any of the products you purchase, uh, the SKU, if you will, and imagine it was not a barcode but a cryptographic key pair, and now you have a one-to-one -one marketing relationship with your brand. The whole world of advertising. Uh, is going to change because for the first time in history you have the opportunity to touch every single person who had something to do with the product. Imagine being able to tip the lady who stitched your shirt in Malaysia because you now have the opportunity to understand the provenance trail. The types of applications that this will create uh, we have yet to understand is uh, it's a foundational change. You know, to talk about Industry 4.0, I think we are on that cusp where information replaces capital. So the whole concept of there being warehouses and stores and all of us going out there and being fed product that is being advertised to us uh, can change when we participate, when we actually become uh, producers and consumers ourselves. Think of a supply chain of one. I mean, these are the kinds of possibilities. I mean, obviously, it takes a while to happen. But that's essentially where this whole train of the blockchain for the supply chain is going. Thank you. So I'm wondering, does the black, let's say, you mentioned that blockchain has an efficient problem. So uh, we always wondering if the, what the big challenge of the blockchain being adopted widely or uh, what would be the blockchain technology is where that could come in the next five years. Uh, Should we have anything uh, coming on this? Blockchain efficiency is an issue if you think of public blockchains and if you think of essentially replicating the data across thousands of zones. But in enterprises, in the supply chain, you might have buyers, sellers, and two banks, maybe an insurance company, five, seven, ten, twelve parties. And the number of transactions are definitely not where you're looking at from the consumer perspective. Now, when you hit the consumer, I think the panel, one of the earlier panelists, talked about layer two. Uh, layer two is where you're going to have to have the efficiency. Layer one just provides that trust that ensures that that product that you're purchasing uh, came from a place where there was no conflict and rules, or there was no slave labor used. I mean, these are the kinds of assertions that the blockchain brings to bear, but it sort of provides the foundation for layer two. Thank you. Um, I think the blockchain technology is evolving very, very fast. Uh, Bitcoin can process five transactions per second, and uh, it's like the gold of. Um, it, it has its uh, reason for being in this kind of uh, transaction. So you believe that will replace yes. those centralized platforms? Yes, and then like um, uh, the Ethereum brought in smart contract, but it it can also pro like uh, process uh, fifteen transactions per second, and. Um, then Nebulous is a new kind of uh, technology and it can process 2,000 transactions per second and it's bringing the ranking uh, ranking like uh, valuation in the blockchain. And now there is a Hedera hash graph uh, which was invented by uh, CMU Carnegie Mellon Professor Lehman, um, Lehman Beard whom I really, really admire. And he could, his uh, hash graph could, can actually process 250,000 uh, transactions per second. Mm -hmm. So I don't expect all the developers or all the application developers to 
uh, actually investigate and follow up and to hire somebody to build this uh, technology themselves. So we would like to, uh, I, I think this technology is evolving fast. And a lot of tools like the super game chain or something like that will provide the uh, easy SDK for developers to use to integrate the latest uh, uh, blockchain technology. And uh, with that, um, I, I believe like um, more and more applications and uh, will we'll be able to actually come into being with the, uh, with the evolution of uh, blockchain. Should just add, um, one of the issues we initially faced was the power consumption um, in our own private blockchain. Um, and being focused on electricity, we wanted to reduce our parasitic load. Uh, how our project started out was we were looking to um, uh, build uh, people within the apartment building for sharing a shared battery and solar um, system. And being energy nerds, we were just really concerned with keeping that parasitic loading of our software right down to a minimum. And in actually solving that problem, we inadvertently created a, a software that could actually be expanded over the entire um, distribution network and uh, thus the entire um, electricity market. So, um, yeah, addressing inefficiencies at a, at a base level is, is, is quite important. Mm -hmm. and, and now the issue we face is uh, issues around scale mm -hmm. and going from commercial scale applications um, to enterprise scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, these, these remain to be solved. Sorry, I'd like to add a little bit. On top of efficiency, there's other, there are other kind of uh, concerns of things that needs to be addressed by blockchain technology, such as uh, like sometimes blockchain uh, is uh, kind of transparent, and sometimes people don't want that transparency. So the customization of uh, the layers of uh, uh, settings are or like control that you want to give the users is also something that can be provided in the future to blockchain technologies. Well, it's quite interesting to see, I mean, that kind of blockchain technology kind of evolving the dot com, you know, period like uh, in 2000, uh, 2000, yes. And then so uh, today, the, the, main, the mainstream solution is still controlled by those big guys like Facebook, Google, and then we are not uh, a uh, couple of weeks ago, Google and uh, Facebook they just banned uh, cryptocurrency ads, uh, and Twitter also uh, banned ads as well. So it's kind of like a warrior between uh, you know those centralized couple, which is the, the big guys in the industry right now, against uh, blockchain, most of that stock company like you. So I'm just wondering that uh, today, I think this morning I also read an article saying that the uh, uh, blockchain associate bank together trying to sue. Google and Facebook will be in the collusion. And then, so my question will be, in such case, how are you gonna I mean, deal with, I mean, try to cohesive with these big guys, the centralized platform, together with this uh, decentralized app? Yeah, from our perspective in the electricity sector, we have to add mirror the rules of the market. So um, uh, in the electricity sector, I'm just referred to as data sovereignty. So who owns their data? So in um, an uncontestable space, so I mean, uh, I guess I presume everyone in the rooms from all over America and abroad. Um, does anyone have a choice of energy retailer? Can I get a show of hands? If you have one energy retailer, like you only can ever choose one company in your area. Yeah, and, and I presume everyone else has a choice of other many other retailers. So, so the markets with choice, um, the the data um, can actually legally be owned by the consumer. Um, that's your private data. Um, your energy meter. It's like your mobile phone number. You own that. You change company. You keep the number new company. Um, but in a non-contestable market where you only have the choice of one retailer, that retailer owns your information. Yeah. And you don't have a choice. Um, yeah. but, so from our perspective, um, we echo uh, what the market's doing. But obviously in the future, um, certainly a fan of um, decentralized data, you can tell a lot about a person from their energy use. So it's quite um, important to remember. Well, I do like the answer of diversity of the market choice. and then. Uh, well, but my understanding is that right now those big guys, it's not, they are not doing nothing because they are the leading position in the market right now. So some of the big guys, they are probably not changing them, I mean, their self as a revolution, changing them from as a centralized platform into a decentralized platform, but most likely it's like left the technology to input part of the component only, so make them become better. So in such case, how do you deal with their straight turn? I mean, like, as we Tony, you are you are the expert in gaming area, you pops it out again and then uh, I read I have changed to read your white paper of your company and then so you are kind of trying to uh, 
fight against Google Play or you know those distribution uh, app stores. So how do you see like that? I think everybody don't want to be left out from the blockchain kind of wave. Everyone wants to catch the wave. The question is at what level? I think there are probably three levels according to my understanding or my thoughts. Like the first layer is the technology layer, the te technology le level. I believe uh, all these uh, big guys would like to get into the technology level. They don't want to be, they, they have the human power to uh, and the talent to actually to uh, do something about the technology of blockchain. I believe they're all doing. I know like there are groups in Google, Facebook, they're all doing like uh, blockchain technology. And uh, that's easy, that's for sure, they're gonna do it. But the second layer is probably the, the value layer, the, all the token layer. And then this layer could be, um, I think, Facebook will be very easy to integrate. They already have a Facebook web credits, and it's very easy to convert to uh, a cryptocurrency to use it. But then, it uh, has to be like uh, uh, so, so. So that's easy for some big guys, but not for all. I think a lot of uh, game platforms out there are like uh, including China game uh, game platforms like 360 or some others. Maybe 360. I forgot. So basically, a lot of uh, game platforms are out there doing blockchain. They they have they, they issue their own tokens. So that is the second layer. Uh, it's almost like a distrib the originally original centralized uh, distribution pan uh, platform plus token. That's the second layer. And then the third layer is the hauling of the ecosystem. That's where you build the trust and uh, transparency and also the decentralized uh, uh, e ecosystem. That is hard for all the big guys. That means it's, uh, it's uh, contradicting to what they have already been achieving and uh, it might take the, their existing profitab profitability, a, like a monetization system out from them and then starting something, something new. That's hard for them and that's easy for us. That's why we are here to provide this, uh, you know, the most complete and uh, the decentralized, most decentralized ecosystem for the gaming world. That's only something new like us can do. Thank you. So, in terms of the large organizations, uh, uh, Google, Facebook, Oracle, SAP, and others. I mean, I think all of them are actively thinking of the blockchain. The key distinction, however, is that uh, blockchain is a disruptive technology, it exposes new business models. Think of HTTP, TCPIP, SMTP, essentially being what they call thin protocols and fat applications. Gmail makes a lot of money because you're essentially a fat app sitting on top of a thin protocol. Tokens are a fat protocol and now you have thin apps. So the world is changing, and I'm sure the large organizations are going to figure ways to confront that change. But this is also an opportunity for startups to try to come in who don't have any legacy to sit back and say, well, we're now entering this new decentralized era. Protocols can essentially pay for themselves with token. There's an opportunity to essentially bring information into the open that was not existing before. And with big data and AI and uh, new types of ways of processing that information, you now have a trustable, actionable source, right? And so this is, I think, a transformational thing. Uh, we see ourselves as being at that sort of intersection of uh, the old meeting the new. Uh, and we recognize that, you know, we think of our competitors as being folks like IBM and SAP. But it's so difficult for them, and it's because they're so large. It's not they're very successful, that's why they're so large. But at the same time, they have legacy businesses that are cash flow positive, and it's very hard for them to, to think differently. Thank you. So I know we are running late, but I do have one more question, especially for Tony. But that means I don't want to delay James. Uh, James uh, is uh, trying to catch on the flight later tonight. So uh, Tony, I do have one more question, because I, I uh, Gino, Gino Mobile is pretty experienced in app development. So, uh, in, in the past, you know, Google and Apple Store, they are uh, 
duopoly uh, and predominant in the app distribution channel. So uh, my question is that how do you think is the decentralized app or blockchain app that will describe those the uh, uh, Google App Store distribution? Because uh, in, in the past, it's like uh, today, for example, there's a record that 2017 Google and Apple and App Store business just hit a, a record uh, and then got year over year 15% growth again. So that's a huge revenue everyone wants to earn. I put in a mobile, mobile manufacturer or all those uh, intermediate uh, like uh, Kaiser. So how do you think yourself as you are sort of like building a platform against those centralized platform? So how do you see you gonna disrupt those uh, Google store? That's a great question. I really like it. <laughs> so uh, I think um, in the App Store, there like currently in App Store, just like what you just mentioned, um, how many users can control what kind of a games they want to see, what kind of applications they want to see? They cannot, and not by the developers either. It's all controlled by the editors or the stores. They decide what games out of the millions of uh, applications that they want the users to see. So, and uh, do they care about the user? There, is there any user identity associated with the stores? No. You are just a number to them. So, uh, the, it's, uh, it's, it's totally centralized and it's decided by the few kind of uh, editors or it's everybody will fight to compete for, the, for being featured on the stores or get onto the uh, leaderboard, use whatever means you can. But I think um, this, is, uh, this is not right. I think developers, uh, the users is not just, uh, it's not just a number. They're the identities. They spend a lot of money, a lot of time in the games. They should be proud of their gamer identity. And uh, they should have the right to choose what kind of applications they would like to use, what kind of games they want. And they could also probably invest in some applications from their conception stage so that uh, the, the, the developers can be funded by the end users or get market validated from the beginning to provide the best kind of uh, market validated uh, applications or games for the users. So that's why we are providing this uh, super game chain so that gamers can create their gamer identity. It, it is anonymous but it is their real gamer identity that can be associated with all the other like gaming act activities in the game and uh, they should be able to um, uh, we will use AI to uh, match their interest and provide the games to them for them to fund, to vote, to, um, to play without charging them, uh, without charging the developer the user acquisition cost and then without um, the, the users have to uh, give out their privacy. So I, I think this, um, like the blockchain enabled uh, game platform should be, uh, uh, should be identity oriented and should be more centralized that the current app store cannot do and they will not do. Not just they cannot but also will. Actually, can I just add to that as well? Um, so, uh, the application I've spoken to about thus far tonight has been peer-to-peer -peer trading electricity. Um, but we're about to release uh, another white paper called Asset Germination. So, um, there won't be a token sale or anything like that. Um, all this is is a, a paper describing our next application. Um, and what it, what it is, is we're enabling our power token holders to um, use their power tokens um, to finance um, infrastructure and electricity markets. So just in the same way that um, uh, Google Play or um, Apple may have a hegemony in terms of um, the marketplace, um, at the moment your network operators and um, utility services providers, they control your electricity market. And they decide what's built. Um, they pay for what's built. They, they, they make decisions based on 40 year time frames. They sign fuel contracts for 15 years. But what we will enable is um, people to be able to um, in implement their own infrastructure so a good example of that would be um, in a third world country that has no electricity network. Um, that's 1.2 billion people on this planet, so not everyone has that. 
and what they can do is using our platform, uh, they can incentivize uh, power token holders to fund a solar farm for a remote village. And what happens then is that uh, people in that village can participate as well. And what it does is it keeps any profit that comes from generation in that village within the village. And in that village can afford a battery and so on and so forth. The village next door can do the same thing. And then between the two they can fund uh, a line, some kind of uh, network line to transact between one another, um, all utilising our software. And so that is the network effect where you can actually have a self-designing decentralised network. Um, and, and this is what's coming next in the electricity space. Thank you. Uh, if, if you think of SAP and Oracle uh, supply chain software or Microsoft Dynamics, these are siloed systems used by large enterprises. Uh, the world is moving into a more collaborative space where the same invoice is shared between buyer and seller. So what is needed is a shared ledger or a distributed ledger. And so that is the change that we're seeing, at least in our world, where the uh, siloed systems are transforming into shared systems. And who owns the system? No one really. But everybody is a participant or has a stake in that. And the blockchain governance model essentially becomes a very valuable mechanism by which different organizations are able to uh, participate, work with, incentivize, motivate their supply chains. Think of Walmart and its 100 thousand suppliers and how is it that today they can sort of use uh, the power of their purchasing to get them to adopt their silo technology whereas tomorrow we have an agile supply chain where everybody essentially broadcasts to an asynchronous uh, Twitter-like uh, secure shared ledger and provides access to those individuals or groups that need access. So that's the way we're seeing the transformation happen from the large silo enterprise software vendors to decentralized world. Thank you. We still have a couple of questions I can cover, but we're running out of time, so I just have to wrap up this panel. So uh, thank you, uh, great panelists, great audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Next, we will be having a very exciting raffle sponsored by Sportdex. And, uh, Let's welcome Mr. Charles Chen, who will generate three winners for us. Uh, we have one first place, one second place, and one third place. And uh, Charles is going to uh, take three business cards from the raffle jar. doing so far? Great. It's a long day. Um, I hope you learn a lot and enjoy the conference as great as I did. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. So uh, my name is Charles. I'm the CEO of Spotex. Today, I only carry one mission to here, which is to give everyone a gift to bring home. All right? So, before I do that, I also have one small request. Please allow me to introduce my team, my work, in less than two minutes. I don't have a watch, but let's go. Cool. So, we are a team from X, Facebook, Instagram, and Microsoft. We are building a decentralized sports community that you can trade your favorite players based on their performance. Just like a stock market, where the performance of the stock is equivalent to the statistics of a player. So thanks for the last six months really like division work for the team. Today, I'm really excited to announce that we launched the product on both iOS and Android. Right, we launched it, we're not just talking, we launched it. So please go to Apple Store or Google Play to download, search us, Sportex. Um, and everyone in this room will be awarded 20 SPO, which is our UTT token, um, in the built-in mobile wallet. It's a limited time only, it's the launch day, also a great conference day, so um, we did it that way. So please go ahead and download it and, and um, 
get this token. Besides that, this is just, just the first step. We are a team extremely focusing on product experience. So we plan to build a fully decentralized, incentivized sports platform for the whole sports community. So let's say you uh, upload a great photo, a great video of the game, you provide a live stream to the game, you will be awarded SPO. Um, and the S profit will just go to the whole community. Uh, okay, um, let's go for the lucky draw. Uh, we will have one silver prize, which equivalizes to 500 SPO and one golden prize, which is 1,000 SPO, and lastly, one platinum prize, which is 2,000 SPO. Um, and Sabrina is our operational head. Lady first, would you like to uh, go for the lucky draw? One. Um, okay. The first third prize from uh, Star Companies, and uh, which is Yang Wang. Are you here? Yang Wang. Okay. So, if you are here, later you can come to the booth number seven and see us over there. Okay. Alright, okay. Alright. Um, the second third <coughs> prize from block 18, which is David Jin. David Jin. Okay, thank you. The third one, let me see. Um, hold on. Um, this one from Cozy City Company and uh, Max Ma. Are you here? Right. Yay! Congratulations! <laughs> okay, so, um, is that me? So we actually have three third prize winners? Uh, one. Okay, silver one. Next. Thank you. The first silver one from Workday, which is Eric Wu. Hello, Eric. Are you here? All right. Okay. I think everybody's joining the booth. From uh, you're probably talking to your team right now. Okay. Um, this one from Nicola. Um, arresting. Probably from Alisium Company. That is a venture capital company. <coughs> All right. So let's try one more time. Um. Here is it. Okay. Uh, which is Hongbin Li from Yunshan? Congratulations. Yay. Come here, please. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You received like a 1,000 SPU token. Congrats. The first one. Okay, I'll let our CEO to take the last one. Okay, the most important one. Oh, okay, everyone is important. Uh, okay, this is Angela Wang from Qingyuan Chuanhou. Is Angela here? Okay. One more time. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, next one would be Jeff Marshall from cross install. We must have gotten the first prize, okay? So let's try one more time. Otherwise, let's bring it home. Okay. Uh, try this one. Uh, Andy Huang, PhD, from uh, Yi Fei Yun. Okay. Oh, All right. Thank you. Congratulations.
It's a Friday afternoon, so uh, let me add a little bit more fun into this presentation. Uh, and this is really why everybody from bank rewards leads to brand marketing leads uh, at large corporates are really excited about Bali. It, it gives them a new hyper-local channel to engage communities. And I said, it, it's even ad hoc communities like this one. Quite simply, what we do with Bali is we use the power of this blockchain engine to bring those promotions and incentives or even your peer-to-peer -peer exchanges to life in the world around you. Uh, and so, I've talked enough about this. If you want to see for yourself, go to the iOS store right now. You can download Volley. Uh, and we've actually placed some incentives here that you can find and see, uh, including an augmented reality. So I'd invite you to do that. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the user experience. I'd love to hear what you think. <clears throat> some of the other differentiators that we're, we're using that powerful blockchain engine to deliver uh, are things like geo and temporal targeting tools, again for brands and merchants focusing on that you know, B2C liquidity and immediacy, uh, an AR display, uh, which you can see if you check out the app, uh, and just an overall UX. You know, we are product people at heart, uh, we're designers, and uh, we really believe in trying to create a great user experience. But again, please check it out for yourself. Uh, just a little bit more context about the business. My co-founder and I, uh, we've actually been in the blockchain space for a while, security space before that. Our expertise is applied cryptography. So we're really good at building these kinds of high-scale engines. And that sort of blockchain immediacy is what really led us to this uh, volley and Tiffany. Uh, we've got a strong group of, of board members and advisors as well uh, who are really focused on scaling up businesses. And, and that's what's really most exciting for us right now is the opportunity to to really scale up. Um, if you haven't heard of us before this from our enterprise days, uh, well, hopefully you'll hear more about us here uh, as we launch Bali uh, into the world. And you know, in terms of the competitive landscape, I, I could go on and on about every single way that we're different uh, and better than uh, most existing marketplaces and, and retail exchanges, but it really boils down to trust and the user experience that we're able to deliver because of that core trust model. Um, so I'm going to leave you with some time back. Hopefully you can uh, get those free coffees that I left for you in, in the Bali app. But um, you know, we think it's the killer blockchain retail app. Uh, we're going to transform how communities exchange value uh, and how brands you know, deliver promotions to those communities. Uh, we're ready to scale and we're preparing to raise another round. Uh, so if you'd like to help us scale up and transform the world, we'd love to talk to you. Shishi, thank you.